Welcome back to Western Religions. This is a video series to accompany a semester-long university course focusing on Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Specifically to accompany the textbook World Religions, Western Traditions by Oxford University Press, but it also works well with any other similar course. Chapter 3 is on Judaism. We're going to start with a brief discussion of the nature of Jewish identity as both an ethnicity and a religion. Then we'll do a historical survey of Judaism and end with a section on life cycle events. This is a little bit about Jewish ceremonies involving things like marriage and death. Section 3.1, Jewish Identity. A little bit about Judaism in general first. There are around 14 million Jews worldwide. The largest concentration is in the nation of Israel with around 6 million Jews. The United States has between 5 and 6 million Jews. Europe as a whole has around 1.5 million Jews. There's about 400,000 in Latin America and about 375,000 in Canada. So if you have to point to founders of Judaism, the most important prophet is Moses. Uh, who received the law or the commandments from God on Mount Sinai. But you can trace the religion at least back to Abraham, uh, whose name means father of nations. God made a covenant or eternal contract with him, saying that his descendants would have uh, ownership of the promised land of Israel, which was the original homeland of the Jews, as well as his son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob. There is a long lineage, though, of other patriarchs, kings, and prophets that are important to the religion. Jews are monotheistic. They believe in only one God who's all-powerful and all-knowing. And they're one of the oldest, if not the oldest, monotheistic religions uh, in the world. Uh, the main texts of Judaism are the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish scriptures. This has three main parts, the Torah, or the books of Moses, the Nevi'im, or prophets, and the Keduvim, or writings. All three of those are together known as the Tanakh. The Mishnah are various treatises on how to follow the commandments, or the mitzvot. And this is also known as the Oral Torah. Most Jews believe it was given to Moses alongside the written Torah. And then there's the Talmud, which is later commentaries on both the Tanakh and the Mishnah. So some of the main teachings of Judaism, apart from monotheism, are that the Jews are God's chosen people, and they have a covenant with God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. They must follow all of God's laws and commandments. Um, that's basically their side of the bargain. And then God will protect them, and in ancient times gave them possession of the promised land of Israel. In the picture is some of the elements with which Jews celebrate the Shabbat, or Sabbath including bread, wine, and candles. The particular type of bread is braided for the Sabbath. It's called challah. So now a bit about Judaism as both an ethnicity and a religion. Judaism historically has primarily been uh, what's called an ethno-religion, and that refers both to an ethnic group and to a religion. This is not at all uncommon in history. In fact, if you go back far enough, almost all religions were ethno-religions. They were the customs of a people that were passed on from one generation to the next alongside language and other parts of the culture. Uh, but the religion was just a part of the culture that focused on how to honor the gods or the spirits. So uh, Judaism, though, is one of the prominent ancient ethno-religions that have survived into modern times. Now, in terms of an, a Jewish ethnicity, the, the ancestry of modern Jews, most modern Jews, go back to the ancient kingdom of Israel, about which more later. So uh, there is diversity of ancestry within Jews. There's different sub-ethnic groups, different populations. There's also converts to Judaism, but many Jews trace their ancestry to a particular part of the Middle East. Judaism is also a religion, however. Uh, now, historically, most people who practice the religion of Judaism are and were ethnically Jewish. Uh, most ethnic Jews also practice Judaism. 
But since the beginning of the diaspora or the dispersal of the Jewish population in antiquity, Jews have mixed with other populations. That's one of the reasons why they divided into distinct subpopulations like Sephardic or Spanish Jews versus uh, Ashkenazi or German Jews. So there's a bunch of different types of Jews, in part uh, ethnic diversity, also religious diversity, uh, diversity in terms of language. Many ethnic Jews today no longer practice Orthodox or traditional Judaism. They're either secular Jews, i.e. non-religious, even though ethnically Jewish, or they practice a liberal form of Judaism, such as Reform Judaism, which developed in the 1800s. Um, the synagogue is a place of worship for Jews. Halakha is the Jewish law. So those are some of the main observances that religious Jews of various kinds will follow. They'll go to synagogue, at least for the Sabbath, maybe every day if they're Orthodox, and they will practice some or all of the law. Now, Jewish clergy are called rabbis or teachers, and these are the types of clergy that have prevailed in Judaism after the destruction of their temple in the year 70 AD. In the picture is just an example of one type of observant or Orthodox Jews called the Haredim. They're also called ultra-Orthodox Jews in English. So they're ones that uh, compromise less with modernity and the secular society. They hold themselves more apart and they really focus on strict observance of all the commandments in the Jewish law. Section 3.2, Early Jewish History. The history of the Jews is traditionally regarded as recorded in the Bible. So the Hebrew word for the Bible is the Tanakh. The Tanakh is an anthology of 24 books by the Jewish reckoning. It contains three main parts. Most of the Tanakh is written in Hebrew, some is in Aramaic. It corresponds to what Christians call the Old Testament, which means the Old Covenant. The first part of the Tanakh is the most ancient. It's called the Torah or the Law. It has five books in it, so it's sometimes also called the Pentateuch, which means five books in Greek. Traditionally, these are regarded as having been authored by Moses or revealed to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. The five books of the Torah are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The second part of the Tanakh is the Nevi'im or Prophets. And these are various later figures that are believed to have been inspired by God, such as Joshua and Isaiah and Jeremiah. There's also the books of Samuel, who is a prophet of God, but who uh, was involved in a lot of the historical chronicles of the early kingdom of Israel. Then the Kedubim is the writings. These are books of different genres. So the Psalms, which are traditionally attributed to the ancient king of Israel, King David, are songs and hymns of praise to God. The Proverbs are wise sayings that go back to the ancient kingdom of uh, Israel. And for example, um, the book of Daniel is another book of prophecy. Ezra, Nehemiah um, tells of the reestablishment of the temple in Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, etc. So uh, the Torah, or the books of Moses, covers the history of the Israelites from the creation of the world to their entry into the promised land of Canaan, which became known as Israel. The, the name Israel, as referring to the land, um, is also a reference to the people, the ancient people lived there, the Israelites. So these were an ancient Middle Eastern people who spoke Hebrew, a Semitic language related to other languages such as Arabic, and who lived in and around what is now Israel-Palestine, probably going back to at least around 1000 BC, if not earlier. The picture on the slide is of several scrolls of different parts of the Tanakh. So how much can the Bible be taken as history? To what extent is it historically accurate? Well, uh, Jews disagree with this, uh, uh, disagree about this among each other. Uh, more Orthodox or traditional Jews might regard all of the Bible as historically accurate, whereas liberal Jews would be less likely to do so. 
Um, historians, scholars also disagree about the extent to which the Bible is historical. Most would say at least some of it is historical, but not all of it. The Israelites were the precursors of the modern people known as the Jews. The biblical narrative in the Pentateuch and after is thus the basis for Jews' self-understanding of their history and their identity, both as a people and as a religion. The picture on the slide is from the Tel Dan Stella, which was discovered in 1993, and it appears to refer to the House of David, i.e. King David, from the Hebrew Bible, thus giving some independent historical confirmation of the existence of King David, but also of the later dynasty of kings that claimed descent from him. Um, so that's a possible confirmation, uh, uh, historically speaking, of some of the information in the Bible. But on the other hand, it's unlikely that all of the stories in the Bible are historically accurate. Um, some are likely legend, or at least they cannot currently be confirmed by modern history or archaeology. For example, the very existence of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and others, can't be confirmed. It doesn't mean they definitely didn't exist. It just means that we lack independent historical confirmation of their existence. Now, it, having said that, it's worth noting that the Hebrew Bible is itself an ancient historical document. So it does give some evidentiary value for um, its histories, just like if you looked at an ancient Greek historical document, you might say this is some evidence that those events actually happened, but it doesn't guarantee that everything in there is true because a lot of the stories are of events that happened way before they were written down. So some of them are at least uh, partially, if not wholly, legendary in all probability. So the book of Genesis begins with the creation of the world and of humanity. There are actually two accounts of the creation in the book of Genesis. The first account is in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis. The second account is in chapter 2. One thing to note really briefly, the chapter and verse numbers that are assigned to the uh, Hebrew Bible were actually developed by Christians, Protestant scholars, much, much later. Uh, so this is actually, though, something that's in common use in modern society in general. So um, that's why we're going to refer to those uh, standard chapter and verse numbers of passages from the Tanakh, even though they weren't originally used by ancient Jews. So in the first account of creation, man and woman are created at the same time, both apparently equally in the image of God. In the second account, this is the story involving the Garden of Eden. The man, Adam, is created before the woman, Eve, who's created from his rib as a helper for him. Uh, many rabbis have used the second creation story to justify man's dominion or precedence over women. Um, so a lot of the beliefs and practices of Judaism as well go back to later texts and traditions uh, or rather younger texts and traditions that were developed after the Tanakh itself. So here's an example of that, the figure of Lilith. A later rabbinic midrash or commentary on the book of Genesis says that the first woman from Genesis 1 was actually Lilith, a female demon, even though it doesn't give any indication of that in the text, but the idea is it's trying to harmonize or make sense of some of those variations in the two creation stories. Lilith and other succubae or female demons who had sex with men, human men, plagued men and were envious of their human wives, according to traditional Jewish belief, causing infertility and miscarriage. So medieval Jews would use amulets uh, or things that provide protection from spirits to protect pregnant mothers and their babies from Lilith. And some um, modern Jews would still believe in Lilith, but um, it's just more part of the traditional lore. And it just gives you a little bit of an indication of how a lot of the rabbinic commentary adds this kind of depth and other layers to the original text of the Tanakh. Let's discuss now some of the different terms used to describe Jews as a people. Um, the origin of the terms Israel, 
Hebrew, Jew, and Semitic. So the earliest historical reference to Israel is the victory stella of an Egyptian pharaoh named Merneptah. And this stella was created around 1208 BC. A stella is basically a stone pillar or monument that has text on it that could record certain events or certain laws or certain proclamations, usually of ancient kings. So one of the lines on the stella says, quote, Israel is wasted, its seed is not, end quote. Apparently, given the Egyptian writing system, the hieroglyph for Israel here refers to a people rather than to a country or a region. So this provides some evidence of a people called Israel living in uh, the land no, used to be known as Canaan. This corresponds to the modern states of Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and southern Syria. So um, this is proof that Israel, in some sense, goes back to at least 1208 BC. Uh, one interpretation of the name Israel is one who struggles with God. And this is based on the story in Genesis of the patriarch or uh, ancient male ancestor of the Jews, Jacob, who wrestled with an angel of God. And after that, he received the name Israel. So Jacob is regarded as the ancestor of the Israelites, and that's why his name would be connected with them. Jacob, according to Genesis in the Bible, had 12 sons, and each of those 12 sons were regarded as the ancestor of the 12 tribes or main divisions of the ancient kingdom of Israel. Um, the word Hebrew, it's not known where that comes from. Nowadays, the word Hebrew is used to refer to the language of the Jews, both in its ancient and in its modern form. Um, it may come from the Akkadian word uh, Ha-Piru, the Canaanite version of which was Apiru. The Akkadians were another uh, Semitic language speaking people in the ancient Near East. And this was a word that referred to uh, marginal people, fugitives, mercenaries who'd be wandering around fighting for different kings and outcasts from society. So they were nomadic or semi-nomadic. Abraham was called a Hebrew, and the prophet Jonah also called himself a Hebrew much later. So um, it's possible that the, the Israelites or some of their ancestors were wanderers or outcasts for at least part of their history. Where does the word Jew come from? So this comes basically from one of the tribes of the ancient kingdom or people of Israel, specifically the tribe of Judah. This uh, occupied part of the southern territory of the ancient kingdom of Israel uh, in Canaan. Um, and after the northern part of Israel was conquered by a foreign empire, the Assyrians, the uh, only remnant of the original kingdom was centered on Judah in the south. And so later followers of the religion, or you could say later members of the people of Israel, just became known as people from Judah or Jews in English. Now, the word Semitic, that's usually used nowadays to refer to a group of languages, including Hebrew, Arabic, and ancient extinct languages like Akkadian, other languages like Aramaic. They were spoken by a bunch of peoples in the ancient Near East. Uh, the word comes from Shem, who in the Bible is one of the three sons of Noah, the person who survived the great flood in antiquity. And uh, Jews believe that they were descended from Noah via his son Shem. So they believe uh, they use the term uh, to refer to all other peoples who had that common ancestry. And later linguists use it to classify the language group to which Hebrew belonged. Uh, in the picture, you can see uh, a much later depiction, actually by a Christian artist, of the patriarch Jacob wrestling with the angel and thus earning him his name, Israel, the one who struggles with God. Now, there's different interpretations of this. Um, if this is the correct interpretations of Jacob's name, Israel, there's still possible different ways of interpreting the meaning of it. But one is that even though the people of Israel have a special covenant with God, they're the chosen people, this is not just an easy or obvious relationship. They have to struggle perhaps to 
understand God or to know God or to be able to follow his commandments. Uh, historically speaking, when was the Torah, the first part of the Bible, written? This is the part that talks about Moses and the law and the covenant with God and thus the formation of the Israelites as a nation. Um, so the traditional view, um, this would be one held by Orthodox and other traditional Jews, is that the Torah was all divinely revealed to the prophet Moses on Mount Sinai, revealed by God, and written down by him as a single document. Um, and so let's explore that story a little bit more before we move on to a more modern or scholarly view about the origin of the Torah. So as told in Genesis, the ancient Israelites migrated to Egypt under Jacob and his son Joseph. So there was a famine in Canaan where they were living at the time. Um, there's a long set of stories, but the long and the short of it is Jacob and his 12 sons go to Egypt. And Joseph in particular helped the Israelites thrive there because he was able to interpret um, the dreams of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He gained favor of the Pharaoh and then the rest of his family was able to benefit ultimately thereby, although they had some struggles and disagreements and such like. So the uh, Israelites or the descendants of Jacob called Israel prospered in Egypt. They lived there for several centuries. They multiplied, but then a new dynasty of Egyptian kings, the new dynasty of pharaohs took over who didn't have a relationship with the Israelites and the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. This is the story as it's told in Genesis and Exodus. So the Israelites became slaves in Egypt and um, Exodus basically begins with the birth of Moses. He's a Israelite by birth, but he's uh, raised by Egyptians. He's abandoned when he's a child, uh, put on the river Nile in a basket. He's discovered by the daughter of the current Pharaoh who raises him as an Egyptian. He eventually learns his true ancestry and starts identifying more with the Israelites. God calls on him to work as a prophet and to lead his people out of Egypt, even though Moses is not so keen on the idea. And the Egyptians, the Pharaoh specifically, um, don't want to let the Israelites go because they're basically using them as slaves. But Moses is inspired by God, warns the Pharaoh that if he doesn't let the Israelites go, that Egypt will suffer calamity. And indeed, there's a series of 10 plagues that God sends against the Egyptians to try to force their hands. Um, the last of the plagues is the worth, worst, the death of the firstborn, where the firstborn sons of the Egyptians are all killed by the angel of death or the destroyer angel. So eventually Pharaoh uh, changes his mind. He lets the Israelites go because of all these horrible plagues. And Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt into the desert, into the wilderness where they wander for 40 years. During that period, Moses received revelations from God, including the Torah received from God on Mount Sinai. So eventually, after the 40 years of wandering, the Israelites are able to reach the promised land of Canaan. Moses catches a glimpse of the promised land, a view of it, but he's not actually able to enter it himself. After he dies, the Israelites in Canaan are led by Joshua, his successor. But this is the traditional view that all of the Torah was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai and then written down by Moses himself in antiquity. The modern view is that the Torah did not have a single author. It was a composite of independently authored documents, some of which may indeed go back to Moses or you know, back to uh, the early Iron Age, maybe the late Bronze Age, somewhere in there. So sometime before 1000 BC, but it didn't have a single author and it was probably edited together much later. Um, now, some scholars suggest part of the book of Exodus may date to the 13th century BC, assuming it was inspired by an actual historical migration, although that is itself controversial. Many scholars don't think that the Israelites, at least not as an entire nation, were ever in Egypt, were ever enslaved, and actually 
were led by Moses to the promised land. It's not impossible that something like that happened. Um, there were migrations of other Semitic peoples like the Shasu, for example, into and out of Egypt. Um, there were peoples uh, that were ruled by the Egyptians as clients um, that were Semitic. There were nomads wandering around. So it's not impossible, historically speaking, that something like the Exodus happened. Although some scholars suggest that it was not all of the ancient Israelites who were in Egypt, but maybe just one of the tribes of Israel. And they retained some perhaps legendary version of their history, and it was spread to the other tribes of Israel, and they kind of all adopted it as their common narrative of their origin, their history. That's not definitely true. It's just an example of how this may have happened historically. Um, one thing that's generally agreed on, though, is that the archaeology contradicts the biblical narrative of the books of Joshua, where it describes the Israelites totally destroying all the Canaanite cities and occupying the land. Archaeologically speaking, there seems to be a lot of continuity between um, the beginning of the kingdom of Israel and the preceding civilizations in Canaan. So at some point, the Canaanites, for example, may have evolved an identity as Israel, or some people may have migrated to Canaan and taken this identity of Israel, and it may have been shared among other people. There's a lot of possible scenarios. But one version of the Torah and how that was put together that's been very influential is the documentary hypothesis, first proposed by the German scholar Julius Wellhausen in 1883. And the basic idea of his version of it is that the Torah contains material from four different sources that have a different style, vocabulary, and theological viewpoint. Now, this has been updated and modernized over the decades, so the current version of it is a bit more complex in terms of how the uh, text of the Torah was formed. Um, it remains influential, but it must be noted that the details about the four sources have been widely questioned. Um, so even if it's likely uh, that the Torah is a composite, it's not necessarily the case that any of the scholarly theories that have been proposed have the exact correct solution for what the original sources were and how or when they were edited together. So the Passover is one of the big celebrations, one of the big festivals within Judaism. And it's mentioned here because it connects to the story of Moses and the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt into the Promised Land. Specifically, it's connected with the tenth and final plague against the Egyptians to force them to let the Israelites go free from slavery. The um, death of the firstborn. So the angel of death or the destroyer angel was sent by God to kill the firstborn child of every Egyptian family. And Moses was told to tell the Israelites that they could protect themselves from a similar fate by sacrificing a lamb and marking the doorways into their homes with its blood. The angel of death would see the blood and pass by or pass over the house, hence the name of the festival in English. Um, so this is celebrated in the spring and it commemorates the liberation of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So it's the first of three pilgrimage festivals, or Shalosh, Shalosh Regalim in Hebrew. The Torah itself commands the Israelites to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate these three festivals. This was the ancient custom. All the Jews who it was feasible traveled to Jerusalem if they were you know, close enough. Then they would travel there and uh, perform sacrifices at the temple at these three times of year. On Pesach, or Passover, ancient Jews would sacrifice a lamb at the temple. And the two other pilgrimage festivals were Shavuot and Sukkot, about which more later. So one of the main elements of the Passover festival is the Seder, a ritual meal during which the Haggadah is read aloud. So this is a series of prayers and stories. Uh, there's a lot of symbolic foods that are eaten during the Seder. One of them is the matzah, or the unleavened bread. This connects to part of the story where the Israelites had to flee Egypt very suddenly, and they didn't have time for their bread to rise from the yeast or the leaven. And so they eat flatbread or matzah for Passover. 
Shavuot is another of the pilgrimage festivals. It is celebrated in May or June. The date varies because in Judaism, there's a lunar calendar that's used. The cycles of the moon don't correspond exactly to the standard solar calendar. So Shavuot celebrates God's revelation of the Torah to Moses on Sinai. Its origins, historically speaking, also lie in the first fruits festival in ancient Israel, where the first fruits of the barley harvest would be offered to God. It's called the Festival of Weeks because seven weeks pass between the second day of Passover and the day before Shavuot. The, it's the second of the Shalosh Regalim, or pilgrimage festivals. So one of the practices of Shavuot is reading of the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, which are ten of the most important commandments revealed to Moses, although Jews tend to count 613 commandments. That's the standard number that rabbinic Judaism uses. And also a reading of the book of Ruth. So Ruth is another book in the Tanakh, not part of the Torah, but it's set during the barley harvest. So it's appropriate with Shavuot. Um, these readings from the Decalogue and the book of Ruth have been in the liturgy for this festival since the second century AD. So they go back to the origins of rabbinic Judaism. One of the rituals performed for Shavuot is staying up the entire night, reading from a book that contains passages from every book of the Tanakh and from every section of the Mishnah. The ritual was developed in the 16th century and it represents devotion to the Torah because that's the main purpose of this festival is to celebrate the revelation of the Torah. There's another practice of eating sweet dairy foods such as cheesecake or blintzes which are cheese-filled pastries. And this is to recall the Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 11, where it says the Torah is like honey and milk under your tongue. Sukkot is the third of the Shalosh Regalim, the pilgrimage festivals, and it commemorates the Israelites wandering in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 years before they were permitted to reach the promised land of Canaan. It's also called the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles. It's an, it's an eight day festival that falls in September or October. And during the festival, Jews eat and sleep outdoors in tabernacles or booths or tents. So they're kind of like rustic structures that may have palm leaves or other uh, things like bamboo sticks or pine branches for the roof. And they're supposed to be holes in it. So the, uh, the roof is supposed to have gaps through which the sky is visible. visible. It takes its name, um, Sukkot, from the temporary structures used by ancient farmers in Israel when they were watching over their ripening crops. So that part of the festival is inspired not just by the wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness where they had to live in tents, but also by this later custom within the promised land of settled farmers who were out in the fields to watch over their crops. Um, so basically, not all Jews would actually live in the uh, booths throughout the entire festival, but the more observant ones uh, do perform that practice. Uh, and here's actually pictures of uh, tabernacles from modern Israel. So Jews regard themselves as the chosen people of God, and this is how the ancient Israelites understood themselves. The name for God in the Bible, which we'll discuss more later, is the four letters of Hebrew that are transliterated into the Roman alphabet as YHWH. W -H. It's called the Tetragrammaton, or the four letters. Um, scholars think this was probably pronounced Yahweh. We're not exactly sure about that because ancient Hebrew did not include vowels in its writing system. But here's a passage from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 6, about the Israelites being the chosen people. Quote, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people his treasured possession, end quote. 
where it says the Lord in all capitals, that is a way of writing the Tetragrammaton or the name of God, which Jews believe it is uh, basically sinful to speak out loud. You're not supposed to say the name of God. So the Israelites also are regarded as having chosen God. It was a mutual covenant. Uh, so here's a passage from Josh, Joshua chapter 24, verse 22, quote, Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses, end quote. So the Jews regard themselves as not only being chosen and thus special, but also as having a special responsibility to serve God. So it's a two-way street. The picture in the slide is of Moses leading people through the Red Sea that he was able to part miraculously in order to let the Israelites escape an Egyptian army that was chasing them, led by the Pharaoh. Um, some people interpret this story, by the way, as not referring to the Red Sea, but rather to um, a marshy wetland that would have been in eastern Egypt, which could have blocked passage to um, the deserts further to the east, including Sinai and Canaan. Um, either way, the story says that the water was lowered miraculously to allow the Israelites to cross through it, and then it was raised miraculously again so that it trapped the Egyptians and destroyed a lot of Pharaoh's army. So important to the concept of the Jews or the Israelites as the chosen people is the concept of covenant. The Hebrew word is Brit, which means treaty, alliance, or pact. So in antiquity, this would be a contract between two parties that had mutual obligations. Um, as opposed to a promise, for example, which might be just a one-way obligation. Um, biblical covenants are often interpreted not just as any old contract, but as eternal or perpetual. So they're very binding. Um, they cannot just be broken off arbitrarily if one party wants to end it. Covenants were common in the ancient world, both between nations and between individuals. And there was an ancient uh, practice in Israel that you could seal a covenant with an animal sacrifice. A bunch of animals would be slaughtered, their carcasses would be divided in half, um, and these halves would be lined up in two rows, and the parties to the covenant would walk between the rows of half carcasses. Uh, you know, basically to symbolize that they're in this together, it's a mutual thing. Um, so there are other covenants in the Bible besides that made with the Israelites via the revelation to Moses. So there's an earlier covenant with Noah, the man who was not sinful, who was righteous. And so God warned him about the flood so he could escape the flood with his family uh, and thus reestablish humanity on earth. After the flood, after that receded, um, there's a covenant made by God with Noah, where God promises that he would never again send a flood to destroy the whole world. And uh, there were also moral rules that Noah and everyone else had to follow. So this is sometimes called the Noahide covenant. And uh, Jews may believe that this covenant is actually still binding on all humanity, not just Jews, even if they're not aware of it. There was a later covenant with Abraham, who is the ancestor of Jacob or Israel. So the Israelites were descendants of Shem, one of Noah's sons, through his descendant Abraham. And there were other um, descendants of Shem through other of his descendants. But Abraham was born not in Canaan, the later promised land of the Israelites, but rather further to the east, in the city of Ur in Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq. So Abraham traveled westward with his extended family towards Canaan. And at Haran, when he reached the town of Haran, Abraham was called by God to continue west into Canaan. Once he was there, God entered into a covenant with Abraham. So God promised to give Abraham's descendants the land of Canaan. And he also promised that Abraham would be uh, a father to many nations. His name was originally Abram, but it was changed after the covenant to Abraham, which means father of nations, not just of the Israelites. But the Israelites specifically would um, 
be able to have the land of Canaan, provided that Abraham showed obedience to God. So that was Abraham's end of the bargain. So Abraham, meanwhile, asked God for a guarantee of the covenant, and God passed between a row of split animal carcasses, just like the ancient custom, in the form of a smoking pot of fire and a flaming torch. This is described in Genesis chapter 15, verses 17 to 18. So as another sign of the covenant, Abraham underwent circumcision, which is the removal of the foreskin of the penis at the age of 99. Now, Abraham was married to a woman named Sarai, whose name, by the way, changed to Sarah after the covenant. Um, and God promised Abraham that he would have a son. Now, Sarah laughed at this because she was too old to give birth to a son, or so she thought. So God miraculously allowed her to conceive uh, through union uh, with Abraham, and uh, she gave birth to the son Isaac. And Abraham had um, the son Ishmael through his uh, through the, the handmaiden, the servant of Sarah, because she thought she wouldn't be able to give him a son, but miraculously she was able to conceive. And Israelites regard themselves as descended from Isaac rather than from Ishmael. But God asked Abraham after Isaac was born and was a boy, he had raised, uh, lived for several years, God then asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. So Jews interpret this as a kind of test of Abraham's faith. A burnt offering would be an animal sacrifice offered up to a god. Uh, it'd be like the biggest or the most momentous type of sacrifice that would have been practiced in ancient Israel and surrounding lands. There were people in antiquity, specifically the Phoenicians, who lived to the north of the Israelites, who worshipped a god named Moloch, and they sacrificed their firstborn of their children to Moloch to try to assure their fertility and prosperity and success. So Abraham was kind of probably shocked and surprised by this, but he went along with God's command. And just as Abraham was about to kill his son, as you can see in the uh, painting on the right, an angel appeared and brought a ram that he should sacrifice instead. So there's different interpretations of this story, but one is the idea that Abraham and by extension the Israelites after him were to sacrifice everything that God asks but that God would provide um, and that God is kind of guiding things to um, make his you know, will be known in the world. So Abraham has to be willing to sacrifice Isaac, but in any event, God is going to follow his promise and will allow Isaac to be a patriarch who will give birth eventually to the descendants of the Israelites and they will occupy the promised land just as God had promised. Uh, and then Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob made further covenants with God. So to a large extent, the history of the Israelites is the story of these different covenants their ancestors made with God. Circumcision is how Abraham marks, one of the ways he marks the seal or sign of his covenant with God. And this is a ceremony that all Jewish males undergo, typically eight days after they're born. This is called Brit Milah, or the Covenant of the Circumcision. And it's just called Bris in Yiddish, which is a dialect of German spoken by Ashkenazi Jews, or at least traditionally. So circumcision is a sign of the covenant between Abraham and God. It involves the removal of the foreskin of the penis by a mohel, which is a ritual circumciser. And the ceremony is usually conducted at home in the presence of family and friends, but it can take place at the synagogue. So this is still done today because it marks the fact that Israelites or modern Jews inherited this covenant with God through Abraham. So um, let's go back to the story where um, Jacob and his sons were in Egypt. So according to the tradition, each of his 12 sons is the ancestor of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 tribes were essentially different uh, districts or regions of the kingdom of Israel, who part of their self-understanding was that they were related to each other. They were descended from a common ancestor um, who was the namesake of their tribe like Dan and Judah and so on. 
Um, so during a famine, Jacob and his sons had migrated out of Canaan into Egypt. That's why they went to Egypt in the first place, to escape the famine. As I mentioned previously, Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob, became favored by the Pharaoh after interpreting his dreams. And this eventually, after a long series of uh, reversals and things, uh, the brothers were uh, struggling with each other, then they reconciled. Joseph reconciles with his father. The whole family moves there, and they're at first favored by the Pharaoh and prosper. But after many generations, a new dynasty of Pharaohs arises who enslaves the Israelites. So Moses was born an Israelite, but raised as an Egyptian. And even though he wasn't keen to perform this function, God called on Moses to lead his people, the Israelites, to freedom in the promised land of Israel. So a bit more about the covenant with Moses. This is described in the book of Exodus in the Torah. The Hebrew name for Exodus is Shemot, or names. And it tells the story of how God, through Moses, led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to Mount Sinai and eventually to the Promised Land. Um, once he was on Mount Sinai, um, Moses walked up the mountain. He was surrounded by a cloud. And amid thunder and lightning, God spoke out of the cloud to reveal his commandments to Moses. Moses stayed on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And while he was gone, the Israelites who were camped below felt lost and afraid. So they persuaded Moses' brother Aaron, who was the first priest of the Israelites, to make a golden calf that they could worship as an idol. Well, once um, that was discovered by Moses, uh, the Israelites were judged by God. There were punishments. But the whole story of the Exodus shows the Israelites being given commandments by God. They agree to the covenant, but then they fail to uphold their end of the bargain. So one of the lessons that Jews might take from this is that the commandments are sort of their obligation. It's the source of their identity as a people. But there's going to be a struggle for them, a kind of spiritual struggle to maintain fidelity and faithfulness to the commandments. A big part of uh, Judaism is not worshiping idols, not worshiping graven images. They do worship God, but never in material form. And that's kind of uh, also illustrated in this story. So the heart of the commandments given to Moses are the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. It appears twice in the Torah, once in Exodus chapter 20 verses 2 to 17, and again in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 6 to 21. Deuteronomy, the name in Greek means second law. It's basically a later version of the law or the Torah that was um, discovered by King Josiah. It may have been just authored after the book of Exodus, but historically speaking. So there's different ways of numbering the commandments, but the Jews often say the first five commandments mainly concern responsibilities to God, whereas the second five mainly concern responsibilities to other humans. So the first five are, you shall have no other God to set against me. And that's important because the Israelites were monotheistic. Now, through much of their history, actually, the Israelites, and you could say before them, the Canaanites, were polytheistic. And this is even described in the books of the Tanakh itself. The Jews and other Israelites are often accused by prophets of reverting to polytheism, of worshiping other gods like Baal or Moloch or the goddess Asherah. And they're criticized as such and called to abandon the worship of other gods. So at some point or points in their history, the Israelites were polytheistic, but they're called upon by the commandments to only worship God. Um, the second commandment, you shall not make a carved image for yourself, nor the likeness of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. So that's this idea that uh, worship God, but don't worship him in an image. God is conceived of as a transcendent being in Judaism, someone, some being who transcends any form, any shape. And that's one part of the interpretation of why they would be commanded to do this. He cannot be reduced to one image, one form. 
The third commandment, quote, you shall not make wrong use of the name of the Lord your God, unquote. And the Lord here is in all caps. Again, it refers to that sacred or holy name, the Tetragrammaton. Historically speaking, um, this name was only allowed to be uttered by the high priest of the Israelites once a year in the temple in Jerusalem, in the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies. So it was considered uh, going against the commandment to use the name of the Lord otherwise. To this day, Jews will not say the Tetragrammaton. They'll use the word Adonai, which means Lord in Hebrew instead. And that's why the convention is when it's translated into English, the word Lord is used, but to indicate it's the Tetragrammaton there in the original text, it's put all in caps. The fourth commandment, quote, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy, unquote. So the Sabbath or Shabbat is one of the main practices of Judaism. It's the day of rest where Jews are not supposed to work. They're supposed to spend the day in prayer and worship. The fifth commandment, quote, honor your father and mother that you may live long in the land which the Lord your God has given you, unquote. So part of that that's interesting is the connection between honoring parents and being able to live in the promised land. So that's a way of understanding the whole covenant with Moses that if the Jews follow these commandments, they'll be given the ability to live in the promised land. But if they violate them, that could be revoked by God. And the second five commandments, as mentioned, concern responsibilities to other humans. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false evidence against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife his slave, his slave girl, his ass, or anything that belongs to him. A bit more about the name of God in the Hebrew Bible. As mentioned, there's the tetragrammaton, or the four Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Vav, He. And the original vowels of the divine name are unknown. This is one of the main names for God in the Bible. There are others, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, ancient Hebrew, like a lot of other ancient alphabetic languages, uh, or scripts rather, was only written with consonants, not with vowels. Although, um, Hebrew, the way it's written today, there are, are marks that are indicated above the um, letters so you can tell what vowels to pronounce. Uh, with the Tetragrammaton, though, it was considered... Um, sacrilege to pronounce the name except for the high priest saying it um, in the holy holies once per year and so instead of giving the original vowels of the word the vowels of another word adonai or lord were given instead because when you saw the tetragrammaton if you were reading it aloud you were meant to say adonai rather than the original name modern scholars interpret the name as yahweh uh, one piece of evidence for this is Yah, a shortened form of Yahweh that appears in Hebrew names, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Josiah. Um, so a possible etymology or origin of this name, uh, Yahweh, is provided when God tells Moses, quote, I am who I am, unquote, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So this could suggest an etymology from Hayah, Hebrew for to be, and the name would then perhaps mean something like he causes to be. Either way, it's interesting that God identifies himself with being or amness, you might say. Um, some Jews would interpret that as the idea that God is being itself or the source of being or something like that. So, as mentioned, saying the divine name was regarded as a sacrilege. The divine name is too holy to pronounce. And so Jews will say Adonai, Lord, or even Hashem, the name, instead. English translations of the Bible use capital letters to indicate the Tetragrammaton. So, Lord, usually, or sometimes God, in all caps. Um, there's other names given for God in the Bible, primarily El, which is the ancient Hebrew word that just means God. There's also uh, particular epithets or titles, if you will, given for God. El Elyon, God Most High, El Shaddai, God of the Mountain, and others. 
El also appears in many Hebrew names, such as Daniel, Ezekiel, and Israel. The oldest appearance of the Tetragrammaton is in the Mesha Stella from 840 BC. And you can see the four Hebrew letters that are blown up in the picture, but keep in mind that Hebrew is written from right to left rather than from left to right in English. So from right to left, it is Yod, He, Vav, He. And these are the ancient versions of the Hebrew alphabet. They're written differently in the modern script. So um, Moses, he saw the promised land. He led the Israelites up to the threshold of the promised land, but he never was able to enter the promised land himself. When the Israelites entered into Canaan, they were led by Joshua, Moses's successor. And after Joshua, there were a series of judges who were leaders inspired by God to lead the Israelites in their wars against the Canaanites. So they didn't have a king at this point. They had these inspired prophetic leaders or judges. So the most famous of whom and the last of whom was Samuel. He was a prophet who anointed the first kings of Israel, Saul and David. So anointing was a ceremony done to legitimize the rule of a king. It's like a coronation ceremony, but it involved um, pouring olive oil upon the head of the king. The Hebrew word Mashiach means the anointed one. Um, the English version of it is Messiah. And this refers to the fact that kings of Israel would be anointed in this fashion. The Greek word for Mashiach was Christos. And that's actually where Christians get the title Christos or Christ that they apply to Jesus of Nazareth, who they think was a prophesied Messiah. Uh, that enters Judaism later, though, after this period of the early kings. So um, Saul was the first king of the Israelites, anointed by Samuel. Um, but he was replaced by David, uh, who started out as a young shepherd who killed a giant warrior of a rival people of the Israelites, the Philistines, with his slingshot. And he was secretly anointed by Samuel, the greatest. David is regarded as the greatest king of Israel. Um, he's the author of the Psalms in the Bible, at least traditionally. He conquered neighboring peoples, so he ruled Israel at its largest territorial extent. And yeah, he's just regarded as the king of Israel in its golden age. The map shows a kind of modern interpretation of the United Kingdom of Israel when all the tribes were together in one kingdom with their capital at Jerusalem, at Jerusalem as it's described in um, the Bible. So this is referred to as the United Monarchy because later on Israel split into two main kingdoms. David's successor was Solomon, and Solomon is famous for being wise, but also for building the first temple of the Jews. The temple was the center for ancient Judaism, where all Jews performed sacrifices. And this is talked about a lot in the books of the Bible, that Jews should worship and sacrifice only in the temple in Jerusalem and not at other high places or altars in other parts of Israel, some of which were dedicated to other gods. Um, the sacrifices and other temple rituals were only performed by priests or Kohens from the tribe of Levi or Levites. And this provision is specified in the book of Exodus. It's among the commandments that the Israelites had to follow based on the revelation to Moses by God. The picture on the slide gives a cutaway diagram of Solomon's temple, and a few elements are worth mentioning. So there was an outer court not shown in the image, um, surrounded by a wall, and also an inner court walled off from the outer court. So the basic idea is you go through a series of gates and you're getting closer and closer to the Holy of Holies, which is the most sacred place in Israel. That's where the presence of God was believed to dwell. Um, also in the inner court are the altar of burnt offering and the molten sea. The molten sea was a large basin of water uh, made of bronze, I believe, in which the priests would perform ablutions to purify themselves. 
Um, the labors and bases that you can see off to the side were also used for ritual washing. The altar of burnt offering is where uh, animal sacrifices would be performed to uh, honor God. Um, and so the priests, the Levites, are the only ones allowed to perform those rituals, although they would be performed on behalf of other people. So one of the main burnt offerings was the sin offering, where you could give up an animal to be sacrificed to the Lord to expiate or get forgiveness for a sin you had committed. And then there's the structure of the temple itself. It had two main pillars in the front. You can see one of them there, each of which had a name. There was the main hall or sanctuary of the temple, and then an inner sanctuary where only the high priest could go. Um, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. That was a, a holy container that contained the broken tablets of the law that had been given to Moses on Mount Sinai. There were also two cherubim or a type of angel that were placed on uh, images of them that were placed on either side of the Ark of the Covenant. But there were, even though there were images in the temple, there was no image or um, idol you could say that represented God Himself. And that was based on the commandments from the uh, Torah. And the Torah gave specifications for how the temple was to be built. It was modeled after the tabernacle, tabernacle or the temporary tent-like version of the temple that was erected by the Israelites when they were wandering through the desert under the leadership of Moses. So historically speaking, the tabernacle story from Exodus may have actually been inspired by the later temple built by Solomon uh, or you know by ancient kings of Israel rather than vice versa but the way the Israelites understand their history traditionally is that the sacred structure of the tabernacle that was mandated by God for the Israelites in the wilderness that became the model for the later temple built by Solomon so after the period of the rule of David and Solomon and the early kings, Israel became divided into two main kingdoms. The northern kingdom, also called Israel, because it included most of the 12 tribes of Israel, and the southern kingdom, also called Judah, because Judah was the largest of the subdivisions or tribes that were part of the southern kingdom. The capital of the northern kingdom was at Samaria, and it was conquered by a foreign empire, the Assyrians, in 722 BC. This was catastrophic for the northern kingdom because the Assyrians deported many of the people of Israel and then imported people from other parts of their empire. This was a strategy used by ancient empires to help prevent rebellions in their territory. So the 10 tribes that were part of the northern kingdom of Israel are sometimes called the lost tribes of Israel because basically they were dispersed throughout other parts of the Assyrian Empire and they lost their identity. Although the later people known as the Samaritans may have descended from the original inhabitants of the kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom of Judah survived for longer. Its capital was at Jerusalem and many of the kings of Judah um, that are described in the Tanakh were critical of or attacked the worship of other gods and goddesses, such as Baal, Moloch, and Asherah, and would destroy their sanctuaries that included high places or altars and Asherah poles, um, which were sacred to the goddess Asherah. One of the main examples of that is King Josiah, who discovered a scroll of the law, or interpreted as Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, in the walls of the temple. Um, so he portrayed himself as restoring the earlier or original version of the religion that had been revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. There were also various prophets at this time that would criticize kings of Judah for worshiping other gods or for failing to uphold the commandments in other ways. Eventually, though, the southern kingdom of Judah was also brought to an end. It was conquered by the Babylonian Empire in 586 BC, and many, if not most, of the Jews had to go into exile in Babylon, especially the leadership. So their regime was kind of decapitated, so to speak, and forced into exile to prevent them from organizing rebellion against the Babylonian Empire. So um, this is known as the Babylonian captivity or the Babylonian exile. 
um, and it represents the beginning of the diaspora or the dispersal of Jews from their homeland in Judah. The theme of exile, of wanting to return to the homeland, being unable to, is very prominent in later Jewish thought. Jewish prophets such as Isaiah during the exile received revelations about a future Messiah or anointed king who would restore Jerusalem and the kingdom of Israel. Um, so this is something that's still waited for by Jews today, by many Jews. They look forward to a future Messiah who will restore their ancient kingdom and thus give them the promised land and kind of restore their covenantal relationship with God once more. The exile in Babylon ended in 539 BC when the Babylonian Empire was itself conquered by another empire, the Persian or Achaemenid Empire, under Cyrus the Great. And the Jews were actually enthusiastic about this, even though they still were under the rule of a foreign empire, in this case the Persians, Cyrus the Great was much nicer to them. He let them return to Jerusalem. He let them rebuild their temple. So they were very satisfied with being able to restore their sacrifices and thus their relationship with God. Some Jews did stay behind in Babylon, but many took the opportunity to move back to Judah. So a bit more about the Samaritans. This is another ethno-religious community that is related to the Jews, but has many distinctive beliefs and practices. They broke off from Judaism sometime in antiquity. They may descend from the ancient northern kingdom of Israel, which had its capital at Samaria. So they have their own version of the Torah or the five books of Moses, but it is different from that used by Jews. For example, um, according to the Samaritan Torah, the tabernacle or portable shrine of the Israelites was set up on Mount Gerizim, not Shiloh. Um, also, they don't regard Jerusalem or its temple as the center of worship. So it would make sense if the Samaritans were descended from a kingdom based to the north of Jerusalem, because that's where their main sanctuary is, Mount Gerizim in Samaria. They had their own temple there, which was destroyed in the second century BC. But there are still a few Samaritans left, and they do perform a sacrifice on Passover at Mount Gerizim, at the foot of the mountain. Unfortunately, there's only around 600 Samaritans left, but it's fascinating that they still keep up their ancient traditions. Section 3.3, the Second Temple Period. The Second Temple Period lasted from 515 BC to 70 AD. It's named after the fact that the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem. Solomon's temple had been destroyed as a result of the conquest by Babylon, but a new temple was built in its place. Ezra is a, was a priest who led the reestablishment of the priesthood and worship in the new or second temple in Jerusalem. So there's a book in the Bible, the Tanakh, that describes this history, these events. Another important figure was Nehemiah. He was a Jewish political leader who served as governor for the province of Judah or Judea within the Persian Empire. And the Jews were able to rebuild the temple in part with help of the Persians. So the Persian emperor Cyrus the Great is praised in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew scriptures. So the second temple was rebuilt and then rededicated in 515 BC, and it remained there for centuries, all the way up until when it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. The picture in the slide is a depiction of Ezra reading from the Book of the Law. The Jewish festival of Purim is associated with the period of time in which the Jews were part of the Persian Empire. It's celebrated around the month of March. Specifically, it commemorates the story in the book of Esther, in which Esther, an ancient Jewish woman, and her uncle Mordecai helped save the Jews from the schemes of a Persian official named Haman. So Purim, the name of the festival, means lot. So it refers to a lottery by which Haman determined when he would attack the Jews. Uh, this was one way that divination or randomization methods 
were used in antiquity, they could decide when the proper time was for an attack, uh, for example. So some of the practices associated with the festival of Purim, it's a very joyous festival. The book of Esther is read aloud in the synagogue and congregants will use noisemakers to drown out the mention of Haman's name every time it appears in the text. People will dress up with in costumes, they'll uh, engage in various forms of merriment and revelry. There's a festive meal with much drinking of wine. Um, Hamantaschen are eaten. This is the Yiddish name, which means Haman's or Haman's uh, pockets. There are three-sided cookies filled with poppy seeds or fruit jam in the center, and they're one of the traditional um, things eaten during Purim. Historically speaking, I've seen at least one archaeologist argue that the Hamantaschen might actually be descended historically from a triangular sweetbread that would be eaten for a festival honoring the goddess Asherah. And there's some speculation that the figure of Esther in the Bible is kind of like a later, you know, non-polytheistic or non-pagan, you might say, version of this figure that used to be a goddess who was worshipped around this time of year. But then the festival was kind of reconfigured when Israel became monotheistic and dedicated to this other female figure, Esther, who is not a goddess, but is a kind of heroine of the ancient Israelites. I'm not totally sure that account is true, but it's credible enough that I thought I would mention it. In the picture is a celebration of Purim in Jerusalem, and you can see the, the costumes and kind of the parade. So eventually the Persian Empire itself fell to foreign conquerors. This time they were Greeks from the West under the rule of Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great was actually not from Greece or Achaia. He was from a kingdom to the north called Macedon. But the Macedonians had adopted a lot of the customs of the Greeks, and the language and customs of the Greeks are what spread with the empire of Alexander. Uh, he was the son of Philip the Great of Macedon, but he used the power of his father's kingdom first to conquer most of Greece and then the entirety or near entirety of the Persian Empire. He spread Greek language and culture to the various lands that he conquered. He established more than 30 cities, 20 of which he named after himself, Alexandria. And these cities had various aspects of Greek culture, like theaters for the performance of comic and dramatic plays, uh, gymnasiums for... Uh, exercise, uh, various types of um, athletics, etc. The version of Greek that became spoken throughout the Middle East uh, during this period was called Koine or the common dialect and it became an international language. Uh, some Jews that were part of Alexander's empire and the later successor kingdoms learned Greek for example. After uh, he died when he was fairly young so he only lived into his 30s and after his death, his empire was quickly broken up, but it was taken over by his generals, divided into several kingdoms that were still ruled by Greek-speaking dynasties. So this is the period known as the Hellenistic era, after the death of Alexander, from the Greek word Hellas, which means Greece. Our word for Greece uh, comes from the Latin Graecia, I believe. Um, I'm not really sure the origin of that word, but it's unrelated to Hellas. So it's called the Hellenistic period because a lot of cities and people were adopting the Greek language and customs. Some Jews combined Greek customs with Judaism. Other Jews abandoned Jewish traditions entirely and just assimilated into Greek culture. Um, and some Jews were the opposite end of the spectrum. They rejected Greek culture entirely. So there were different degrees of Hellenization among the Jews during this time. Um, some Jews, if they used Greek as their primary language, they translated they, the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And this translation is called the Septuagint, supposedly because it had 70 or 72 scholars that translated it from the Hebrew into the Greek. In any event, it was created in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, in the early 3rd century BC, which by that time was a major center of Judaism outside of Judea. 
Um, the picture is from a synagogue that was from the later Hellenistic era. This was several centuries after. Um, this was, I believe, the third century AD that the Dura Europos synagogue was built in. Um, it's the most ancient uh, synagogue, though, that's been discovered and excavated. And so it has some really great examples of ancient Jewish art that was influenced by the Greeks. So it's kind of like a Hellenistic version of a Jewish synagogue. So I mentioned that Alexander's empire broke up after his death. Um, it was divided into different Greek kingdoms ruled by their own dynasties. Two of the important ones were the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. The Ptolemies were based in Egypt and the Seleucids were based in Syria. Um, the name Judea was used by the Greeks basically for um, the, what was formerly the kingdom of Judah. Uh, so specifically in Greek, it would have been pronounced Judea. But that's where we get this more Greek version of Judah from, Judea. That name was also used by the Romans. In 305 BC, Judea fell under the control of the Ptolemies. That was a Greek dynasty that ruled Egypt. But in 195 BC, the Seleucids, a rival Greek dynasty, conquered Judea. And one of the kings of the Seleucids, in particular, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, which means kind of divine manifestation, he sounds kind of full of himself, um, he posed a lot of problems for the Jews. First of all, he advocated complete assimilation to Greek culture, which the Jews didn't want to do. Among other things, they had their own god. They didn't want to worship Greek gods or use Greek religious rituals. He prohibited reading and teaching the Torah. He even burned some Torah scrolls and ordered the death penalty for Jews who observed the Sabbath. He also um, ordered the death penalty for Jewish mothers who had their sons circumcised. And maybe the worst thing he did from the Jewish perspective was called by the Jews the abomination of desolation. At one point, he desecrated the temple in Jerusalem by placing statues of Greek gods there, including a statue of Zeus, and by sacrificing pigs on the altar of burnt offerings. This is described in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. So um, he replaced the high priest of the temple, uh, Onias III, with his more Hellenized brother, Jason, in exchange for a bribe. So he was interfering with the priestly hierarchy that governed the temple and thus that had religious authority over the Jews. Then he replaced Jason with an even more Hellenized priest named Menelaus in exchange for an even larger bribe. And he further restricted Jewish practices after the Jews revolted against his interference with the priesthood. Um, and in particular, Jews who followed the law, the Torah, were often tortured and put to death. So he was trying to forcibly assimilate all the Jews to Greek culture, probably because he sensed in some way that the Jews would always be rebellious as long as they had their own religion and their own customs. The picture on the slide is a portrait of Antiochus IV from one of his coins. Well, eventually the Jews got sick of this treatment by Antiochus IV, and some of them rose up in revolt against the Seleucids. Um, the leaders of the revolt were called the Hasmoneans. They were a family of priests who led an uprising in 167 BC against Antiochus IV. Their leader was Judah Maccabeus. His name Maccabeus meant the hammer. Um, and his brothers led a band of guerrillas who were based in a village outside of Jerusalem. So they had an irregular, ar irregular army that was hard for the army of the Seleucids to meet in battle and to destroy. They were successful in recapturing the temple. They purged it of idols and they rededicated it, reconsecrated it to God in 164 BC. So they weren't given full independence, but they were strong enough militarily that the Seleucids had to basically make a deal with them. So they let the Hasmonean kings continue to rule Judah in exchange for taxation or tribute. And they remained client kings of the Seleucids 
up to 63 BC. So it was about a hundred year period. Um, and some Jews during this period continued to adopt Hellenistic culture, despite the fact that they had been able to restore their traditional worship in their temple. The festival of Hanukkah or the festival of lights celebrates an event in the revolt of the Maccabees against Antiochus IV. Specifically, it commemorates the rededication of the temple by Judah the Maccabee. According to the Talmud, which is later rabbinic commentary, um, when the temple was purified, only one vessel of oil could be found to light the menorah. The menorah was an elaborate seven-branched oil lamp that was placed in the temple. Now, the oil that they found in the temple only should have lasted for one day, but miraculously, it burned for eight days. And so Hanukkah is an eight-day festival. And one of the ways it's celebrated is that families will have a small menorah in their home, and they'll light an additional candle for each day of the festival. Another uh, practice is eating foods fried in oil, which is connected to the uh, lamp oil used by the original menorah. But such foods can include latkes or potato pancakes and sufganiyot, which are donuts with a jam or caramel center. Um, there's also the custom of the dreidel, which is a four-sided top that can be spun. And each side has a letter, nun, gimel, he, or shin, which stand for four Hebrew words, meaning a great miracle happened there. In the land of Israel today, Jews will make dreidels where the letter shin is replaced by pei, which stands for the Hebrew word that means here. A great miracle happened here. So during this time of the rule by the Hasmoneans and also by the Seleucids, basically during the Second Temple period, there were two important factions uh, of Jews in Judea, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There were other factions and sects as well. We'll get to those in a moment, but these were two important ones. The Sadducees were the priests and other wealthy elites who controlled the temple in Jerusalem. They made up most of the membership of the Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish council that governed the religion. The Sadducees ran the temple and the sacrifices. They regarded only the Torah of Moses as genuine scripture, as genuine revelation. They had a fairly narrow and literal interpretation of the law or the commandments. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead or the day of judgment, which had been talked about by some of the later prophets. The Pharisees, by contrast, were not made up of priestly families. They emphasized studying the Torah and following the halakha in daily life, applying the commandments to details of daily life as the main way of practicing the religion, rather than rituals or sacrifices in the temple. They also regarded the prophets and the writings as genuine revealed scripture. They believed in the resurrection of the dead and the day of judgment. They practiced almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, um, not just, for example, temple sacrifice. Their leaders were not priests, but rabbis or teachers who developed their own interpretations of the laws of the Torah, such as, for example, exactly how to keep the Sabbath. What was the precise things you could do and not do in order to honor the day of rest? The interpretations of the rabbis became known as the oral law or the oral Torah, which later rabbinic Jews believed were revealed to Moses along with the written law on Mount Sinai, but just not written down until much later. The oral law was finally written down and codified around 220 AD by Judah Hanazi, the prince, and it became known as the Mishnah. The picture in the slide shows the traditional vestments or garments of the Kohens or priests, including the high priest on the right from the temple. And a lot of the details of this dress were specified in the Torah. So God actually commanded the Israelites how their priests were supposed to dress. The Essenes were a sect of ascetic or world-renouncing Jews who lived in a monastic community in Qumran in the Judean desert. 
they were the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in a cave in the 20th century. These scrolls date to, from the 2nd to the 1st centuries BC, and they actually include the oldest extant manuscripts of the Tanakh. So the Essenes prized ritual purity. They performed ablutions in water. Like the Pharisees, they sought to apply the Torah to daily life, but more rigorously. They objected to the Hasmoneans' management of the priesthood and the temple. They regarded the priesthood of their own day as no longer legitimate. And it was not just the Essenes. There were some other Jews as well from that period. The second temple period after the Hasmoneans uh, were in power as being illegitimate because of all the political interference, not only by Antiochus IV, but even by the later Jewish Hasmonean kings as well. The Essenes had an apocalyptic worldview. The word apocalypse means revelation, specifically of the end of the world. So their view was that the world was currently under the control of evil forces, but that God would soon intervene and defeat the powers of darkness. And they believed that they were going to be a part of that story. They believed that they were the new children of Israel and would take back the promised land with God's help. This community was destroyed, though, by a Roman army in the second century AD. They were able to hide some of their scrolls in a nearby cave, and that's why they were later able to be discovered. Another group of ancient Jews was known as the Therapeutae. This was the name given to them by a Hellenized Jew, Philo of Alexandria, who lived between 20 BC and 50 AD, and he wrote about them in one of his treatises, De Vita Contemplativa, or On the Contemplative Life. So the Therapeutae lived in several monastic communities in Alexandria and throughout the Jewish diaspora, but the main group of them that Philo described were around Lake Mariotis in Egypt. Unlike the Essenes, their community included women as well as men. The men and women did live separately, but they would meet to worship, sing hymns, and dance. So they renounced private property and family, that's why they're described as monastics or monks, and they devoted themselves to God, praying and studying all day. Although the Jerusalem temple was supposed to be the central focus of Jewish worship, there were other temples in antiquity. So foremost among them, the Samaritan temple of Mount Gerizim. There was also a couple of temples in Egypt. One was on an island called Elephantine, in the Nile River. This was built in the 5th century BC for use by a Jewish military colony that was in service to the Pharaoh. Later, um, there developed some communities of Jews in Ethiopia, and at least some of them claim that they're descended from the Jews of the island of Elephantine. The uh, other ancient temple in Egypt was the Leontopolis Temple, which was located north of what's now Cairo. This was built in the 2nd century BC by that high priest Onias III after his forced removal by the Seleucid king Antiochus IV. It lasted until 73 AD. Shown in the slide is a picture of some of the modern excavated ancient ruins of that island of Elephantine in the Nile in Egypt. So the Jews in the Second Temple period, especially as time went on, were developing views of the future, prophecies of the return of the Messiah and what that might look like, although different groups of Jews had different beliefs. Many Jews hoped that a Messiah would liberate the Jews from the Romans. They eventually conquered Judea from the Seleucids and establish a new kingdom of Israel with the help of God. And there were various prophecies and expectations about this messianic age or age of the rule of the Messiah. The Essenes awaited two messiahs, one that they thought would be a king and another who they thought would be a priest. Um, there was also a belief among some Jews that there would be a new covenant between God and his chosen people. This was stated or at least hinted at in some of the prophets in the Tanakh. There was a belief that there'd be a new era of justice and equality established by the Messiah. 
And there were prophecies that all peoples, not just the Jews, would worship God at Mount Zion. Zion is a hill in Jerusalem upon which the temple was built. And there were also prophecies that the dead would be resurrected and there'd be a day of judgment in which the righteous would live in this new established kingdom of God, whereas the wicked would be sent down to Sheol or permanent death, the grave. Despite the many differences among sects and parties of ancient Jews, there were many points of consensus. So the Jews generally agreed on the following. Monotheism, there's only one God who is an all-powerful creator. They all accepted the status of the Torah as the revealed word of God to Moses. They accepted that Israel were the chosen people of God. And that the temple in Jerusalem is where God dwelled to be worshipped by his people. And even though we mentioned all these different sects and movements, most ancient Jews did not belong to a particular sect or political faction, although they may have been influenced by the ideas of some of them. Section 3.4, Roman rule. The Romans took over control of the Hasmonean kingdom in 63 BC under their general Pompey. The Romans ended the Hasmonean dynasty not that long thereafter, a few decades after in 37 BC, and they appointed other client kings such as Herod the Great to help them rule the province of Judea. The Romans appointed Herod the Great as a client king in Judea. He was an Idumean, that is, he was from Edom or Idumea to the south of Judea. The Idumeans were converts to Judaism, and thus they were regarded as somewhat foreign by the Jews in Judea proper. But in particular, Herod was not liked because he was despotic. He was kind of a harsh ruler. But nevertheless, Judea and the lands that he ruled had a lot of prosperity during his reign. He built cities, fortifications, aqueducts, temples, and theaters. He expanded irrigation systems, and he did a pretty good job of maintaining order and reducing the levels of banditry. One of the cities he built was the port of Caesarea Maritima on the coast. He also built several fortresses, including Masada, which would later play a role in a rebellion against Rome. Herod is infamous, among other things, for murdering his wife, Mariam, and three of his sons because he suspected them of treason. The Emperor Augustus was quoted as saying he'd rather be Herod's pig than his son, allegedly based on that incident. Um, Herod also rebuilt the Second Temple, and it was known as Herod's Temple, making it larger and grander. Another faction of Jews was the Zealots, who originated in the first century AD during the period of Roman rule. They refused to cooperate with Rome and urged Jews to engage in violent rebellion. They instigated the first Jewish revolt in 66 to 73 AD. This was initially successful, but the Zealots were eventually destroyed by the Romans. The Romans sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Uh, ripping down all the stones such that barely anything survives to this day. That happened in 70 AD, and that actually marks the beginning of rabbinic Judaism, about which more later. Most of the Jewish population of Jerusalem was killed or enslaved. The last holdout of the revolt was a group known as the Sicarii, who were radical zealots named after a type of dagger, the Sicarius, they used to assassinate their enemies. This uh, remote mountain fortress of Masada was very difficult to besiege, but the Romans did it, and rather than surrender, the Sicarii all committed suicide. So the Western Wall, sometimes called the Wailing Wall, is the only remnant of Herod's Temple, or his upgraded version of the Second Temple. Today, Jews will often pray at the Western Wall. The remains of the temple there are still regarded as the holiest place in Jerusalem and the holiest place in the world for Jews. In antiquity is when Jews began gathering at the Western Wall to mourn the destruction of their temple. 
Jews may also leave notes with personal prayers placed in the cracks of the wall. The festival Tisha B'Av, or the ninth day of the month of Av, commemorates the destruction of both the first and the second temples. And on that festival, thousands of Jews will gather to mourn at the Western Wall. There's segregation of the sexes, according to the Orthodox Jewish custom. Men will pray on the left side of the wall, while women pray on the right side. There were other revolts against the Romans. One was led by Shimon Bar Kokhba. His name was Shimon Bar Kosoba, but he was nicknamed Bar Kokhba, or Son of the Star, which was a title given to the Messiah in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17. But he was known by his critics as Bar Kosoba, Son of the Lie. So Bar Kokhba's revolt against the Romans lasted from 132 to 135 AD. It was triggered by the Roman Emperor Hadrian's plan to build a Roman city on the ruins of Jerusalem with a new temple but to the Roman god Jupiter Capitolinus. Bar Kokhba's rebellion was defeated and it got even worse for the Jews. All Jews were expelled from Jerusalem on pain of death. The city was rebuilt and renamed Ilia Capitolina and the province of Judea was renamed Syria Palestina. The Palestina part is where we get the word Palestine from, and this was a deliberate ploy by the Romans to insult the Jews because they got the name Palestina from the Philistines, an ancient people who used to live in the region who were regarded as the enemies of the Jews. In other words, the Romans defeated the Jews, exiled them from Jerusalem, and renamed their homeland after their biggest ancient enemies. The destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD ended ancient Judaism and initiated the Rabbinic period or Rabbinic Judaism. The Rabbinic movement was the successor to the earlier faction of the Pharisees, and it was the main beliefs, ideas, interpretations of the Pharisees that determined the later development of Judaism. So Rabbinic Judaism is the name for most forms of post-Second Temple Judaism. So it's the main form of Judaism practiced today. It's marked by the end of sacrificial worship at the temple and the loss of power and authority by the class of priests or Kohens. This was a necessity in a sense because of the destruction of the temple. The new focus was on prayer in the liturgy that would be celebrated in groups, in uh, the synagogues or places of assembly, uh, following the commandments or the mitzvot, and things like almsgiving, giving to charity, and other forms of proper conduct. So with the destruction of the temple, the synagogues or places of assembly became the new centers of worship and study of the Torah. The Hebrew word for commandments is mitzvot, and following and interpreting all the commandments became the main form of worship in Rabbinic Judaism. By the end of the first century AD, most Jews lived outside of the Roman province of Judea or Syria, Palestina, and many Jewish boys were learning to read so they could study the Torah because that had become the main way of practicing the religion. So the significance of this is that even though they were living outside of Judea, they were speaking different languages based on where they were living, maybe Greek, maybe Latin, maybe other languages. Um, some Jews also still spoke Aramaic at this time, but they would all know Hebrew uh, because they were all studying the Torah. So Hebrew became a kind of common language among the Jews, even in exile from their homeland. Two early figures that influenced the development of Rabbinic Judaism were the rabbis or teachers, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai. Rabbi Hillel was an older contemporary of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was basically the rabbi of the Christians, but the Christians originated as Jews, but they broke off as a separate sect. So we'll talk more about the Christians in a later video. Rabbi Hillel was active between the years 30 BC and 10 AD, roughly. He was a popular teacher. He was a woodworker who became the head of a yeshiva or religious school. One of his famous quotes is, quote, 
What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the entire Torah. Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. End quote. And according to the story, this was his attempt to summarize the Torah while standing on one foot when he was challenged to do that by a stranger. Another famous early rabbi was the rabbi Shammai, and he had, took a stricter, more literal view of the Torah. And he had many debates with Rabbi Hillel, more than 300 of which are recorded in the Talmud, at least according to tradition. A lot of these stories were probably later accounts, um, probably legendary. Later rabbinic scholars usually followed Rabbi Hillel's interpretation that was more kind of open, more focusing on the general idea of loving neighbor, not doing harm or hateful things to the neighbor. Even though that was so in terms of what they regard as the essence of the Torah, if you look at the actual rulings of a lot of the later rabbis, they were also kind of following the ideas of Rabbi Shammai, that the essence of Judaism is following the commandments in a very strict way that kind of infuses itself all throughout your life. A bit about gender roles in Judaism. Uh, both ancient and rabbinic. The long and the short of it is women were subordinated to men in all areas of life, virtually judicial, religious, sexual, and economic. However, women were also not required to perform as many mitzvot or commandments as men. Generally, they only had to fulfill commandments that were negative, like the thou shalt nots of the Ten Commandments, and not bound to a specific time, although there were some exceptions. In the ancient Greco-Roman diaspora, some Jewish women would serve as heads of synagogues or as patrons of civic and religious institutions. But generally, there was a divide between the sexes and the women were of lower status. For example, only boys and men were allowed to study the Torah. There is one exception to this that was named in the Talmud, uh, Beruriah, she was, according to the tradition, a woman who studied the Torah. She was the daughter of one rabbi and the wife of another. According to one tradition, though, she committed suicide after being seduced by one of her husband's students. So uh, there were two main centers of rabbinic Judaism, one in Palestine and the other in Babylonia, although there were several schools in Babylonia. So um, the one in Palestine was in Galilee, so to the north of Jerusalem. The Romans recognized the patriarchs or head teachers of the Palestinian area as leaders of the whole Jewish community. The Romans eventually granted the Jews exemptions from pagan sacrifices. The Palestinian patriarchs were descendants of Rabbi Hillel. So he was kind of the font or the source of their authority and their tradition. By the 3rd century AD, the Roman Empire was already starting to go into decline because of frequent wars, and there was an economic and political decline in many of the Roman cities. So that's eventually what paved the way for the rabbis further to the east in Babylon and then in Baghdad to assume greater authority over rabbinic Judaism. In Babylon, the community was led by an exile arc or a chief authority of the exile. At this time, Babylon was ruled by the Parthian Empire and then later by another Persian Empire, the Sassanids, after 226 AD. The Sassanids at first persecuted the Jews and members of several other religions because they were promoting a Persian religion known as Zoroastrianism. But by the mid-3rd century AD, they gave Jews considerable autonomy and recognized the authority of their leader, the Babylonian exile arc. There were a couple of major academies in the area of Babylon. Um, so one was an academy at the city of Nehardia that was established by Samuel bar Abba, who lived from around 165 to 254 AD. He was a wealthy scholar who was on good terms with the Persian emperor and thus was able to secure toleration and just a good living conditions for the Jews in the area. Um, Abba Arika was a Palestinian rabbi who later moved to Babylonia in 219 AD 
and founded his academy in the town of Sura. The main later Babylonian academies were the one of Sura and another at Pumbedita, and these became the main centers of Jewish scholarship until the 11th century AD. So it was during the first few centuries AD that uh, Christianity started to become more powerful. And eventually they came into conflict with Judaism, even though Christianity originated as a sect of Judaism. One of the main reasons why they became very distinct is because Christians accepted Gentiles or non-Jews as converts. And pretty quickly, most of the Christians were actually Gentiles or non-Jewish. At first, Christianity was harshly persecuted by the Romans, but eventually one of the Roman emperors, Constantine, converted to Christianity after he had given legal toleration of it. And eventually, by 380 AD, Christianity had become the official or state religion of the Roman Empire itself. Um, so one of the instances of early tensions between the Christians and the Jews, or other Jews, you might say, were the way the quote-unquote Jews were depicted in some of the Gospels or accounts of the life of Jesus in the Christian New Testament. Now, keep in mind that Jesus was a Jew. All of his core followers, the apostles, and most of his disciples or followers in general were all Jews. Nevertheless, the Gospel of Matthew blames the quote-unquote Jews for the death of Jesus. Probably what Matthew and the early Christians were thinking of is not Jews in general, many of them were Jewish, but rather the authorities, especially the priestly establishment and other factions of Jews who had political power in Jerusalem, because the Sadducees especially were the ones who conspired to have Jesus put to death. Um, there's also quotes from Matthew like, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So Jesus was critical of various other factions of ancient Jews. Um, and that later caused uh, Christians, especially Gentile ones, of blaming the Jews generally, not just the ancient priestly hierarchy, on the death of Jesus. Or holding them responsible, rather, for the death of Jesus. Um, another instance of the growing divide between Christians and Jews can be found in the letters of Paul the Apostle. Paul was a Pharisee, a Jew, who at first persecuted the Christians because he regarded them as heretics and blasphemers, but had a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus and became a follower of Jesus and a Christian himself. He visited many communities of Gentile or non-Jewish Christians, and he urged them in his letters not to adopt Jewish customs and observances. Justin Martyr was a 2nd century Christian who authored a dialogue called Dialogue with Trypho. And in this work, he said that Christians have replaced Jews as the true and spiritual Israelite nation. So this was a common view of later Christians. They looked at Jews as the antiquated form of their religion, as the old covenant that was no longer relevant that the Christians were the new, true Israelites, the true Jews, they were the ones that were maintaining the new covenant or the New Testament with God. John Chrysostom was a Christian bishop of the city of Antioch in Syria, one of the important centers of early Christianity, who lived from 347 to 407. And he criticized Judaizing Christians, i.e. those who still attended Jewish synagogues and maintained Jewish customs. So early on, Christians, based on some revelations to their apostles that are documented in the book of Acts in the Bible, they um, believed they got these messages from God that it was no longer necessary to be circumcised, to follow all the Jewish commandments in order to be a Christian. But the early church tolerated Jewish Christians. After a certain point in time, some of the church bishops and other church fathers or leaders started to criticize Christians who were also Jewish. So that kind of solidified the divide between the two religions. Another example of anti-Jewish sentiment from one of the early fathers of the church was St. Augustine, who lived from 354 to 430 AD. He was from North Africa, uh, but then later in his life he moved to um, Italy. He said that Jews should not be eradicated 
but should be allowed to live in suffering. Quote, do not destroy them, lest my people forget, unquote. So he's echoing Psalms chapter 59, verse 11 there. So there's this idea that, yeah, Jews should not be killed, but they should basically be placed in a position where they're not comfortable. They should be reminded that they have not recognized the actual Messiah. There's basically a lot of resentment that a lot of Christians had against Jews for not recognizing Jesus as Messiah. And then eventually um, some Christian kingdom started persecuting Jews. And these persecutions continued off and on for um, centuries, but they were kind of periodic. So some Christian kings would actually welcome Jews because they could be used um, to help boost trade, the economy. A lot of them were skilled in craftsmanship. A lot of them were educated. So they could be very useful, but then sometimes sentiment would turn against the Jews and they might be persecuted either by violent mobs or by their rulers or both. An early instance of this is the Germanic king Sisebut of the Visigoths who ruled Spain from 612 to 621 AD. And he demanded that Jews convert to Christianity on pain of death or exile. The rabbinic Jewish movement developed additional texts apart from the Tanakh or the original Hebrew Bible. This includes the Mishnah or the so-called Oral Torah. That it mainly consists of interpretations of the mitzvot or the commandments in the form of particular observances. This was the core or original text of rabbinic Judaism, and they believe it goes back to Moses himself. It was just something that he passed on orally, not in written form. Um, it's divided into six orders or parts based on subject. One is called the seeds, which focuses on laws governing agriculture. Another is called the appointed seasons, which tells how to celebrate festivals, feast days, and the Sabbath. Another is called women, which has laws for marriage, divorce, betrothal, adultery, and vows. The order called damages focuses on the civil and the criminal law, but it also has the Pirkei Avot, or sayings of the fathers. This is an important summary of the teachings of the early rabbis. The order called Holy Things has observances for sacrifices, ritual slaughter, and priestly rituals. And the order for purities deals with ritual purity and impurity. The Gemara, or teaching, is later commentaries on both the Torah and the Mishnah. It is of two main types. The halakha are legal material about the laws or the commandments and how to follow them. And the agada is narrative material or stories. And then there's the Talmud. Um, this is of two main groups or traditions, the Palestinian or Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Palestinian Talmud is the Gemara produced by the Palestinian academies in the 5th century AD. The Babylonian Talmud was the Gemara produced by the Babylonian academies in the 6th century AD. Eventually, the Babylonian Talmud gained prominence among most rabbinic Jews. Uh, and let's discuss the Jewish calendar. This goes back to antiquity. It's a lunar calendar based on the phases of the moon. Originally, a new month would be based on eyewitnesses who personally observed a new moon. But the sequence of months was standardized in the 4th to 5th century AD by rabbinic scholars. So a calibrated written calendar replaced the eyewitness system. So there are 12 months of 29.5 days each. This leads to only 354 days per year, which is 11 days shorter than a solar year. However, the Jewish calendar adds a 13th leap month, or Adar Sheni, every seven years out of the, uh, sorry, seven years out of every 19, so that the calendar doesn't get too out of sync with the cycles of the sun and the solar calendar. So according to Jewish tradition, the new day actually begins at nightfall, after dusk or twilight, specifically when at least three stars can be seen in one glimpse of the sky. 
And this is important for determining the beginning of the Sabbath or the day of rest, which begins at nightfall on Friday evening and then continues all into Saturday up to the end of dusk on Saturday. So you can see an echo of this tradition in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, quote, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, unquote. The evening is listed first as part of the first day. And Jews also count years from the creation of the universe. So as of November 2023, the current Jewish year is 5784 or 5784. Section 3.5, Jews in the Muslim world. Islam was a religion that emerged in the early 7th century AD as a result of revelations to the prophet Muhammad in Arabia. After, during, and after, during the life of Muhammad and after his death, Islam spread rapidly through violent conquest of parts of the Middle East and North Africa. One of the reasons why the Muslim armies were able to conquer new territories so rapidly is that they were expanding into areas previously held by the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire and the Persian or Sasanian Empire. And these empires had weakened each other through decades of fighting. Also, a lot of the peoples that were under their rule were tired of the burdensome taxes and other policies of the older empires. And so some of them welcomed the Muslim armies that conquered their lands. The Roman Empire survived, but it lost significant territories in Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. It was largely reduced to Greece and Asia Minor. The Persian or Sasanian Empire was completely conquered and destroyed by the Muslims. After the death of Muhammad, the first Muslim caliphate was that of the Rashidun, and they conquered Judea in 638 AD. Under the Pact of Umar, Umar being one of the early Muslim caliphs or rulers, Jews, Christians, and other people of the book, or dhimmis, were allowed to keep their religions under Muslim rule, but they had to pay a special tax called the jizya. Many Jews prospered under Muslim rule, um, but there were some periodic persecutions of Jews, just as there had been under Christian kingdoms and Romans in the past. In 1066 in Granada in southern Spain, there was a massacre of the Jews in the Jewish quarter in the city of Granada. In 1172, the Almoravid dynasty forced conversions and expulsions of Jews and Christians in Spain. So they were a uh, Muslim dynasty that ruled in the uh, territories of Spain and North Africa. Um, so it kind of varied based on the rulers and the century how Jews were treated. It was kind of similar overall in Christianity in that um, sometimes there'd be periods of prosperity and toleration of Jews, but then there'd be periods of persecution. Although it does seem like overall the persecutions and expulsions of Jews were more common in the Christian kingdoms than in the Muslim ones. The Gaonic period was a new period in Rabbinic Judaism, um, largely during the era of Muslim rule. In 750 AD, the Abbasid dynasty overthrew the earlier Umayyads, and the Muslim capital moved from Damascus in Syria to Baghdad in Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq. So in the um, world of Rabbinic Judaism, the main Talmudic academies by this time were in Babylon. But the Babylonian Jewish Academy in the town of Pumbedita moved to Baghdad in the 9th century because it was the new capital in that part of the world, the main um, city. So it was the center of thought, the center of politics, art, commerce, everything. The academy at Sura, by the way, moved to Baghdad in the 10th century AD. So Jewish students from around the Muslim world would travel to Baghdad to study at the rabbinic academies there. The word Gaon is from the leaders of the academies. It was their title. And one of the things they're most known for is the responsa, or answers they would write to questions given to them um, that were written by rabbis from throughout the Jewish diaspora. And these texts, the responsa, became uh, important and um, used for guidance by later rabbinic Jews. 
Rabbinic Judaism, or the Rabbinites, as they were known, became the dominant form of Judaism during this era. The Rabbinites were Jews who acknowledged the Talmud and the Mishnah, and they were the ones ultimately recognized by the Muslim authorities as representative of Judaism as a whole. But there was another sect of Jews that also emerged during this time. They were called the Karaites, or Scripturalists. They were founded by Anan ben David in Iraq in the 8th century AD. And they rejected the Mishnah and the Talmud. They regarded only the Tanakh, the original Jewish scriptures, as authoritative. And they called upon Jews to read and interpret the Torah for themselves, rather than relying upon the judgments of previous rabbis. Um, for a while, they rivaled the Talmudic rabbis in the 10th, 12th centuries AD for influence in the Jewish community. Um, they were very important for studying Hebrew, um, developing grammar, works of grammar, and developing um, editions of the manuscripts of the Bible. Their work influenced the codification of the Hebrew Bible used by Rabbinic Judaism in the 10th century AD. They mostly died out. They still exist today as small communities in Israel, Turkey, and the diaspora. During the period of Muslim rule, many Jews prospered, as previously mentioned, and there was also a flourishing of Jewish philosophy. One of the main figures in this movement was Moses Maimonides, who lived from 1135 to 1204. His background is that he was a Jew born in Spain, but he left Spain when he was a child after persecution of the Jews there by the Muslim Almohad Caliphate. He first moved to Morocco, then to Palestine, and later settled in Egypt. At that time, Egypt was ruled by the famous first sultan of Egypt, Salah al-Din, or Saladin. Maimonides and other medieval Jewish philosophers were greatly influenced both by ancient Greek philosophy and by the medieval Arabic philosophy. The medieval Arabic philosophy um, had largely developed as uh, commentaries uh, and interpretations of Greek philosophy, mainly that of Plato and Aristotle. The Mishneh Torah was one of Maimonides' greatest works. It was a 14-volume code of Jewish law written in Hebrew. He also wrote treatises on medicine and logic. The Guide of the Perplexed, uh, probably his most famous work of philosophy, was written in Arabic because by that time in the Muslim world, Arabic was the main language of philosophy. The Arab philosophers had translated a lot of the Greek philosophy into Arabic, and they were authoring new philosophical works in Arabic. A lot of that Arabic philosophy, by the way, also influenced medieval European philosophy, such as that of Thomas Aquinas and other scholastic philosophers. But the Guide of the Perplexed was um, written for pious Jews on how they could combine reason and science, thus philosophy, with their faith in Judaism. Uh, one of the interesting ideas of Maimonides was that biblical language that describes God with human attributes is not to be interpreted literally. It was only intended to make God comprehensible to humans. So in other words, um, he used the word demut or likeness to refer to these um, non-literal attributes of God as opposed to there being a literal image or tselem of God that described him accurately. So it's just an example of using a philosophical distinction to kind of help make sense of the Hebrew Bible in a way that didn't really conflict with reason or philosophy. Now, there are many different Jewish ethnic groups. Um, some of the main ones are listed on this slide. Jews from the Middle East are known today as Mizrahim, uh, and it's from the Hebrew word for East. They speak a variety of languages such as Arabic uh, or sometimes other Middle Eastern languages like Persian or Kurdish, just depending on where they're from. The picture on the slide is actually singers in a pop group in Israel called Awa, but they're three sisters of Yemeni Jewish heritage, and so they would be an example of Mizrahi Jews. Um, Ashkenazim, their name comes from a Hebrew word meaning Germany. These are Jews from Central and Eastern Europe. They traditionally spoke Yiddish, a dialect of German that also had some words from Hebrew 
and Polish, and I think some other languages too. Many of them, even though um, they originated in Germany, hence the name, and hence they're speaking a dialect of German, Yiddish, many moved to Poland, Lithuania, Russia, i.e. east of Germany, sometimes as a result of persecutions or of invitations from some of the kings of those Eastern European countries. Uh, and then a third important group of Jews is the Sephardim, or Spanish Jews. The name uh, is for a Hebrew word for Spain. And traditionally, they spoke Ladino, a Jewish dialect of Spanish. Many prospered under the rule of Muslim caliphates in Spain, and initially under the Christian kingdoms that later expanded south into Spain. But in 1492, there is a declaration by Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, the king and queen, that it was no longer legally permitted to not be Catholic, uh, or Christian rather, in Spain. And so the Jews uh, either had to convert to Catholic Christianity or they had to leave the kingdom. So some traveled to parts of Europe like the Netherlands, but many migrated to the Ottoman Empire, to the south and east, such as North Africa or other parts of the Middle East. And they continued to speak Ladino and keep some of their own traditions and customs. Another group of Jews is the Beta, Beta Israel or Ethiopian Jews. Um, so this is an interesting group of Jews that was pretty far removed from other Jews in the diaspora. They didn't um, use the Babylonian Talmud, for example. They have a more ancient form of Judaism that doesn't derive from the teachings of the rabbis or rabbinic Judaism. Uh, modern DNA research that I'm aware of shows that they don't have significant Middle Eastern ancestry, but some Ethiopian Jews claim that they were descended from ancient Jews from Egypt such as from the island of Elephantine. And it is completely possible that some of the Jews in Egypt traveled south to Ethiopia. It's pretty easy to reach it on the Nile River, and that's how they spread their religion. Um, but they do have um, a, the ancient, the whole Tanakh, all of the ancient uh, Jewish scriptures. It's also possible that at least some of the Ethiopian Jews were Ethiopian Christians who kind of converted to Judaism uh, for whatever reason. Section 3.6, Jews in the Christian world. In Christian Europe, from the 7th to the 15th centuries, or the Middle Ages, many Jews prospered working as merchants in towns and cities. But they did face periodic persecutions and expulsions from Christian governments. The big one was the expulsion from Spain in 1492, where the king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, ordered all Jews in their kingdom to either convert to Christianity or to leave. Many fled to the Ottoman Empire to the south and east, where they were welcomed by Sultan Bayezid II. Some fled to the Netherlands. Some Turkish Jews still speak Ladino, which was the language of the Sephardic Jews in Spain. You'll see from the map on the slide uh, the major expulsions of the Jews from the years 1100 to 1600. A lot of the Jews in Germany, Austria, and Hungary who spoke Yiddish migrated eastward to Lithuania and Poland. They were often welcomed in the lands that they migrated to because the Jews were often skilled or educated. Many of them were literate because they studied the Torah. They may have been traders or merchants or craftsmen, and so they could contribute significantly to the economy and forming towns in some of these eastern kingdoms. Um, and how they were treated really just kind of varied. Um, over time. In a lot of the Italian cities, they were confined to ghettos or Jewish quarters, and in some of the other cities as well. We get our word ghetto from the Italian, but there were similar districts in other parts of Europe. But So the, the picture is not one of constant persecution or constant expulsion, but periodic persecution and expulsion, some of which would be driven by false rumors about the Jews. The Spanish Inquisition was a religious court in the Roman Catholic Church that had authority to um, punish Christians for heresy. Uh, after the uh, Spanish government started to pressure Jews to convert to Christianity, there was a fairly large group of conversos, or Spanish Jews who had converted to avoid expulsion. 
These were also negatively referred to by other Spaniards as Maranos or swine. Some of these conversos were actually secretly still practicing Judaism and are thus known as crypto or hidden Jews. In 1481, the king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, requested permission from the Pope to establish the Spanish Inquisition to detect and punish heresy in their kingdom, i.e. people who were not following all of the beliefs or practices of Christianity. During the Spanish Inquisition, more than 13,000 conversos were put on trial and that was only during the first 12 years of the Spanish Inquisition. So this was using the power of the government to punish essentially people who were suspected of being Jews still, even if they had formally converted to Christianity. Also during the Middle Ages in Europe, Jews developed Kabbalah, or the Jewish mystical tradition. It's from a word meaning to receive. There were ancient Jewish mystical traditions called Merkba or chariot tradition that go back to the second temple period, if not earlier. But Kabbalah specifically originated in the 12th century AD. So one of the beliefs of Kabbalah is that a person can experience direct divine revelation of God through ecstatic prayer or meditation. In addition to the Hebrew scriptures and traditions, it was influenced by Neoplatonism, uh, a form of Greek philosophy developed by later followers of Plato, like Plotinus, and by Sufism, a Muslim form of mysticism. So one of the key terms in Kabbalah is hachalot, or palaces. There was an earlier Jewish mystical literature that recounted visionary ascents to heavenly palaces. One of the most important books of Kabbalah is Zohar, which means splendor. This was a text of Kabbalah that had a commentary on the Torah that gave mystical interpretations of parts of the Torah. It attributes itself to uh, Shimon bar Yochai, a second century rabbi, but in fact, it was probably written by Moses de Leon, a 13th century Sephardic mystic. One of the main concepts of Kabbalah is Ein Sof, a term for God. It means infinite or without end. And this is God in his transcendent, unmanifest form that's considered to be beyond human thought or any visible or perceptible form or shape. Some of the ways that the Kabbalists articulated their concept of Ein Sof uh, owe a bit of a debt to Neoplatonism, which regards the one or the first principle of being and becoming as beyond all form and beyond all thought. Ein Sof is God as an unknowable creator. But Kabbalah also believes that there's a kind of process or system through which God creates the world specifically the sephirot or numbers. These are 10 emanations or channels through which God creates, which connect God with the creation, with the created world. They radiate from the divine sphere into the human created realm. So light or radiation is used as a kind of visible, perceptible metaphor for the process of creation of the world from God. And the Sephirot can be known by humans, unlike the Ein Sof. The balance of the Sephirot was disturbed after the fall of man, when Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent in the garden and ate the forbidden fruit. And the nation of Israel was given the Torah to help restore the balance of the Sephirot. And following the mitzvot, the commandments, is what Jews can do to help restore the world, restore the creation. Isaac Luria was an important Kabbalist. He lived from 1534 to 1572. He was born in Jerusalem, lived in Egypt, and moved to Safed in Palestine. He didn't write anything himself, but he had many devoted disciples who wrote down his teachings. One of the important concepts of Isaac Luria and later um, Jewish thinkers was tikkun or mending. This means helping to restore the world which was damaged in the creation. And Isaac Luria developed the Kabbalah notion of creation. He introduced the concept of tzimtzum, or contraction. To create the world, the transcendent god Ein Sof 
how to create an empty space because his being was all that had previously existed. His being is fullness. It's complete everywhere. So there's no space to create. But in order to create, he contracted a part of himself, which is interpreted by followers of Isaac Luria or those influenced by this tradition as a kind of divine exile, uh, a type for the later exile of the Jews from God. Divine light then emanated into the empty space, taking the form of the ten sephirot and ultimately as the first man, Adam Kadmon, or the primal man. Light streamed from Adam's eyes, nose, and mouth. And this is the divine light of creation. And then this created vessels that held the light. But the light was so powerful, the, this divine light of creation, that the vessels were unable to contain it and shattered. And then fragments of these luminous vessels became trapped in the material world. And this is the same process as the entry of evil into the world. So there's a concept of Isaac Luria and of Kabbalah generally of Tikkun Olam, restoring the world. Through prayer, study, and fulfilling the commandments, Jews can help liberate these divine sparks that are trapped in matter. And the picture in the slide is of some Jews revering the tomb of Isaac Luria. Sabatai Zvi was a student of Lurianic Kabbalah. In 1666 in Izmir, Turkey, he was declared by his followers to be the Messiah, long awaited by the Jews. He and his followers marched on Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and camped outside the city. The Sultan, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire, which was Muslim, imprisoned Sabatai Zvi and offered him the choice of either death or conversion to Islam. Sabatai Zvi decided to convert to Islam and he changed his name to Aziz Mehmed Effendi. Most of his followers who were Jewish deserted him at that point, but some actually converted to Islam and their sect still survives today in Turkey and is known as Dönme or the Returners. This instance was kind of infamous among Jews, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of later rabbinic Jews stopped thinking or caring so much about the Messiah, because there were several historical examples of alleged messiahs who were then regarded as not having successfully fulfilled the messianic prophecies, and Sabatai Zvi was one of the main examples. Um, I mentioned a lot of the Jews moving from Central and Western Europe to Eastern Europe. Um, originally, Jews in Western Europe often lived in their own communities. But by the early 16th century, a lot of cities in Western Europe began enforcing segregation, requiring Jews to live in designated wall districts called ghettos in Italian. Uh, and that word is used in English now to refer to all of those uh, forced Jewish districts of European cities. Eventually, many Western and Central European Jews migrated to Eastern Europe, to Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. They were initially welcomed because of their contribution to the economy. But because they were originally from Germany, that's why these Eastern European Jews were Ashkenazi and spoke Yiddish, a dialect of German. Although initially welcomed, there were eventually a lot of attacks against Eastern European Jews one of the most infamous was the Komensky Uprising. In uh, 1648, Jews in Poland were attacked during a revolt of ethnic Ukrainian Cossack peasants, who were Orthodox Christians, against the Polish Catholic nobility who ruled them. So these were ethnic Ukrainians uh, related to Russians who were Orthodox Christians, but they were part of the Kingdom of Poland and their rulers were largely Polish Catholic nobles. As part of this revolt or uprising, a lot of Jews were attacked. They were associated by the Cossacks with the Polish Catholic nobility because they had commercial ties to them. And they were kind of blamed for the system of rule or oppression that the Cossacks didn't like. Some Ashkenazi Jews fled back to the West to escape this persecution. And there were other periodic persecutions, and in the 1800s, a lot of pogroms, or 
violent riots against Jews in the Russian Empire. Hasidic Judaism or Hasidism is a movement that began in the 18th century in Podolia, Poland, so in Eastern Europe. Um, Hasidim is a word that means pious or the pious ones. So the Hasidim were Jews who emphasized worshiping with joy from the heart rather than just from the head. The rabbinic leaders of the time had largely emphasized the necessity of scholarship or Torah study as a means of knowing God and dismissed uneducated Jews as less pious. The founder of the Hasidic movement was the Baal Shem Tov, which is a title that means master of the good name, often abbreviated as Besht. Um, his original name was Israel ben Eliezer. So his disciples claimed that he could heal and raise the dead. And his disciples also recorded a lot of stories about him that became the basis for the Hasidic movement. Hasidic men today often wear long black coats, black hats, and long side locks. So one of the main things of Hasidic Judaism, in addition to the joyful or ecstatic mode of worship and the de-emphasis on studying the Torah and the Talmud, were their leaders, the Zadikim, or righteous men. These were not rabbinic scholars in the traditional way, but charismatic men believed to have miraculous powers. Hasidic Jews seek to attain a state of devakut, or cleaving to God, via their relationship with their Zadik, or their teacher, basically, or their master. In the early 19th century, many Zadikim were believed to transmit their authority to their sons. Thus, Hasidic leadership became partially dynastic. The most prominent group of Hasidim are Chabad or Chabad Lubavitch. They were founded by Rebbe Shnur Zalman, who lived in uh, between 1745 and 1813. They follow many of the teachings of Isaac Luria, and they're one of the main avenues through which a lot of Jews encounter uh, the teachings of Luria. Since 1951, Chabad has actively sought out new followers from other Jews, so they're a missionary sect within Judaism. Some Lubavitchers, as they're also known, believe that Menachem Mendel Schneerson, their leader in the 20th century, was the Messiah or Moshiach but not all Lubavitchers believe that. Um, and many Jews will sometimes go to Chabad uh, synagogues or shuls, uh, places for Torah study, even if they don't identify it as uh, Lubavitchers per se. So a bit of the distinction between Hasidim and other Jews. Um, Hasidic Jews uh, as mentioned, engage in enthusiastic or very spirited worship. They will sway around when they're praying. They'll engage in ecstatic dancing and joyous singing. Hasidic melodies actually influenced a lot of later synagogue music by non-Hasidic Jews and some secular Jewish music, especially klezmer music. But even in the uh, 18th century, there were a lot of opponents, or mitnagdim as they were called, to the Hasidic movement. One of the main opponents was the Gaon of the city of Vilna, the Vilna Gaon. So they objected to the Hasidic Jews' introduction of Kabbalah into the daily life of the masses. Traditionally, Kabbalah was reserved for masters of the Talmud and especially chosen mystical adepts. It wasn't just taught publicly or semi-publicly. They also saw the Zadik as threat to rabbinical authority. They criticized the Hasidim for not studying the Torah enough and for lacking dignity in prayer. Despite the opposition, Hasidism spread rapidly, and by the early 19th century, almost two-thirds of Eastern European Jews were Hasidic. Section 3.7, The Modern Period. Hazkalah is the Hebrew name for the Jewish Enlightenment. It grew out of the larger European Enlightenment, which was a movement in the arts and letters in the 18th century. Enlightenment figures valued reason and tolerance and material progress. They were inspired by modern science and hoped to improve society, reform politics to make it 
more free, more egalitarian, what they thought of as more just. The political culmination of the original Enlightenment was the French Revolution from 1789 to 1799, the main ideals of which were liberty, equality, and fraternity. And they attacked the Catholic Church and a lot of traditions like traditional political systems of monarchy and aristocracy. Um, they actually were a very violent revolution too. They executed a lot of their enemies, including the king and a lot of nobles and some clergy. So it was kind of like a very violent, chaotic time, but it was also an idealistic time, a time of growth in science, growth in knowledge, and in the ideals that there could be a just egalitarian society with liberty, freedom, and equality under the law for everyone, including Jews. Partially through the spread of the ideals of the French Revolution, including through the conquests of Napoleon in the early 1800s, some Jews in different parts of Europe were emancipated or given citizenship and equal rights under the law and no longer confined to ghettos as they had been previously. So um, during this time, some Jews took part in this broader intellectual movement, but there was a kind of Jewish subculture enlightenment called the Haskalah. Um, these thinkers, like Moses Mendelssohn, advocated less focus on the study of the Talmud and more emphasis on learning modern languages and practical skills. They also advocated for Jews to integrate into European society. Moses Mendelssohn, for example, urged Jews to, quote, be a Jew at home and a German on the street, unquote. He encouraged Jews to speak German rather than their own dialect, Yiddish. And he published a German translation of the Hebrew Bible, albeit written with the Hebrew script, which was the one most Jews were literate in, and a Hebrew language commentary. So after the Haskalah, Judaism divided into traditional or orthodox branches and more liberal branches. We're going to go through each of these in turn. The two main types of orthodoxy are the Haredim or ultra-orthodox and modern orthodox. And there's various types of liberal Judaism, including reform, conservative, reconstructionism, and humanistic. First, reform Judaism. This is the type of Judaism that emerged out of the Haskalah, or Jewish Enlightenment. Israel Jacobson, who lived from 1768 to 1828, is regarded as the father of Reform Judaism. In 1809, he founded a synagogue and school in Kassel, Germany, that had sermons and parts of prayers in German. This is significant because he was reforming the traditional liturgy or worship service in Jewish synagogues. In 1810, in another synagogue in Zeisen, Germany, uh, there was organ music accompaniment and choir singing in German. These were radical changes to the traditional Jewish liturgy, which did not include instruments like organs. That particular change was modeled after what was often done at Christian churches in the t at the time. In 1818, Jacobson founded the New Israelite Temple Association in Hamburg, Germany. This eliminated references in the liturgy to the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, i.e. one of the ideas of Reformed Judaism is not only looking back to antiquity and the idea of restoring Israel or restoring the temple, but trying to integrate into modern and non-Jewish societies. That's part of the implication of that. Previously, instrumental music had been banned in synagogues since the destruction of the Second Temple. And the rationale for that is that the services were meant to not be celebratory with instrumental music, but rather more solemn or reverent. So even though Jacobson had created some of these reforms in the first two decades of the 1800s, Reform Judaism didn't really begin to grow more broadly until the 1830s but after then it started to take off. In 1848, a German language prayer book was created and it was used by many Central and Eastern European Jews. Um, Abraham Geiger was the next major thinker in the reform movement. He lived from 1810 to 1874. He argued that reform in general was natural to Judaism, 
since it had adapted to its surroundings throughout history. He also emphasized the commonalities between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam to make Judaism seem less exotic to Christians, for example. Um, many Reformed Jews, most of them, do not actually observe the dietary laws that are part of traditional or Orthodox Judaism. Um, they may not eat pork, but they won't necessarily rigorously conform to all the other details of the law, like always keeping meat separate from milk or dairy, for example. More recently, um, Reform Judaism has ordained women rabbis or teachers. The first in North America was Sally Prezand, who was ordained by the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1972. And since then, female rabbis have become pretty common in Reform Judaism. Orthodox Judaism is basically a name for the traditional type of rabbinic Judaism that goes back you know, to the first century AD, ultimately. But the term and the concept didn't emerge until the 19th century because it was a response to or a reaction against Reform Judaism. And actually, the word orthodox specifically wasn't used until the 20th century. One of the founders, though, of the movement was Samson Raphael Hirsch, who lived in the 19th century from 1808 to 1888. He argued that traditional Judaism is fully compatible with modernity, but he also argued that the Torah should be applied to all aspects of everyday life. So his version of orthodox Judaism would be one of the inspirations for what's called modern orthodoxy. So the beliefs and practices of Orthodox Judaism are basically just those of traditional rabbinic Judaism. The Tanakh is the revealed word of God. The Mishnah and the Talmud were written forms of the oral law that goes back to Moses. And Orthodox Jews observe all of the laws of the Torah and follow the rabbinic halakha or observances. There is also a subgroup of Orthodox called Haredim, or in English, they're often called Ultra-Orthodox. Their name means the trembling ones. It's a reference to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 5. Um, they tend to live and work in segregated communities, so they're distinct from the so-called modern Orthodox, and that they're less integrated into non-Jewish and just mainstream modern society. They have a very strict observance to the Halakha, and they also overlap a lot with Hasidic Judaism. So a bit more detail about the dietary laws that are followed in Rabbinic Judaism. These are a development of the original dietary laws from the Torah. So the Jewish dietary laws collectively are referred to as kashrut. They dictate which foods may be eaten and which foods must be avoided and how to cook the acceptable foods, and which types of foods can be eaten together in the same meal. Kosher means fit or proper. It can also refer to non-food observances, like wearing talit or prayer shawls that have fringes um, on the edges, but it's often used to refer to the dietary laws specifically as well. So the scriptural basis for the dietary laws are in the book of Leviticus chapter 11, and Deuteronomy 14 verses 2 to 21. Um, so some of the details on the types of meat that can be eaten. Only animals, uh, specifically mammals, that have split hooves and that chew their cud can be eaten. This includes cows, goats, sheep, and deer, but not pigs or rabbits. With regards to creatures of the sea, only those with fins and scales can be eaten. So that rules out mussels or crustaceans and shrimp. In terms of birds, chicken, turkey, goose, and duck can be eaten, but no birds of prey, such as vultures, owls, or hawks. Um, also, the products of unacceptable animals are not kosher, although bees, which are not permitted to be eaten, um, their honey is permitted to be eaten. It's interpreted as being a product of the flower, rather than being of the bee itself. Only animals that have been slaughtered in accordance with the law are acceptable, and there's a specific way of slaughtering that involves slitting the throat with the sharp knife to try to make the death quick and as painless as possible. 
Additionally, blood from a slaughtered animal carcass must be drained completely before it can be consumed. There's also a lot of laws governing the separation of meat and dairy. This is rooted in the book of Exodus chapter 23 verse 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 21. But the ways and extent to which meat and dairy must be separated has evolved considerably since the origin of those passages in the Torah. Some Jews go so far as to have different dishes or cutlery and sinks and dishwashers for meat and dairy. Those are the two main things that cannot be eaten together. So for example, Jews who uh, practice um, the dietary laws could never eat a cheeseburger. Um, and there's also rules about having to wait between eating different dishes or meals that have meat or dairy respectively. So if you eat a meal that has meat in it, you cannot eat dairy for a specified time that varies between one and six hours, depending on the interpretation. Uh, so foods that are marked kosher are generally not individually inspected by rabbis, but that are from plants or facilities that have been inspected by rabbis. Another main branch of Judaism, apart from Reform and Orthodox, is Conservative Judaism. Despite the name, it's still treated as one of the forms of liberal conservatism because it's not orthodox. This movement was founded by Zacharias Frankel, uh, who lived between 1801 and 1875. His term for the movement was positive historical Judaism. He wanted to find a middle ground between Reform Judaism, which he thought was too liberal or radical, and Orthodox Judaism, which he thought was too traditional. He believed that the core teachings of Judaism were indeed divinely revealed, like monotheism. But he recognized that some Jewish traditions had developed within history, and thus it was okay to modify them. So some of the beliefs and practices of conservative Jews. They generally interpret the scriptures more literally than Reformed Jews, but more liberally, less literally than Orthodox Jews. They do generally follow all of the traditional dietary laws. Um, some conservative synagogues are more liberal and allow, for example, female rabbis or fe full female participation in the synagogue services, the latter of which is not allowed in orthodoxy. And also in orthodox Judaism, the women are seated in the separate area of the synagogue. The main conservative Jewish uh, university or school of higher learning is the Jewish Theological Seminary. So that ordains the conservative rabbis. And another form of liberal Judaism is called Reconstructionism. This was founded by Mordecai Kaplan, who was ordained as an Orthodox rabbi, but he left Orthodoxy first for conservative Judaism and then he kind of founded his own movement that branched off from conservative Judaism. He taught at the conservative Jewish Theological Seminary until 1963, but he had founded his own Society for the Advancement of Judaism way back in 1922. He wrote a book called Judaism as a Civilization in 1934, which argued that Judaism was not a supernatural revelation, but an evolving religious civilization. So he had a more natural interpretation of Judaism as more of a culture than a supernatural revelation. So some of the beliefs and practices of Reconstructionist Jews. For them, the synagogue is more of a social and a cultural center. They believe the scriptures were not divinely revealed, but were created historically by Jewish people. They also performed the first bat mitzvah or female uh, initiation ceremony in 1922. Mordecai Kaplan gave the ceremony to his daughter Judith. This is a variation of the bar mitzvah, which is a part of traditional and orthodox Judaism. It's a ceremony of coming of age for Jewish boys, where they basically show that they have some knowledge of the Torah. So bat mitzvot started in Reconstructionist Judaism, but those ceremonies are now performed often by Reform Jews and Conservative Jews. 
um, the uh, Reconstructionist Jews kept the dietary laws, Hebrew in the liturgy, and wearing skullcaps or capote for men. Um, so Mordecai Kaplan, he was interested in preserving the traditions, the culture of Judaism, even though he interpreted it in a new way. He also did reject the idea of Jews as the chosen people of God. And another more radical aspect of Reconstructionism is the use of gender-neutral language in their prayer book. And then the most liberal form of Judaism is called humanistic Judaism. This is less of a religion than a, a cultural movement. So it was founded by Sherwin Wine, who lived between 1929 and 2007. He was originally a reform rabbi, but he lost his belief in God. He established a secular congregation called the Birmingham Temple in Farmington Hills, uh, Michigan. So the Society for Humanistic Judaism was founded in 1969. Um, and was very influenced by the countercultural movement of the 1960s. It has congregations now across North America. They developed a new liturgy in Hebrew and in English that removes any reference to God. They have new forms of the Jewish festivals, such as a new version of the Passover Haggadah. Uh, humanistic Judaism also welcomes people of all genders, sexual orientations, or even religious backgrounds, and they regard Jewish identity as a personal decision. Humanist rabbis will also officiate at mixed marriages between Jews and non-Jews. So a lot of Jewish uh, ceremony uh, and practice, and this is true for all types of Jews, is focused on communal worship at the synagogue, although there are often there are also um, practices that are done at home. So uh, there's a bunch of terms that can refer to a synagogue. In Hebrew, it's Beit Knesset, or the House of Assembly. Synagogue is basically the same word, but in Greek, or has the same meaning, rather, but in Greek. There's also the Yiddish term shul, which is from the German word for school. This is often used by Orthodox and Hasidic Jews. Reformed Jews may refer to their synagogue as temple because they believe it has functionally replaced the ancient temple in Jerusalem. A synagogue is a place for prayer, study, communal worship, and it often functions as a community center, center or a place for charity, like uh, soup kitchens and beds for homeless people. It's generally run by lay people, by a board of directors, staffed by lay people who hire a rabbi to uh, lead services for the community. And uh, traditionally, the congregation faces Jerusalem when they pray in the synagogue, except for reform synagogues, where they don't always do that. One of the main features of the synagogue is the Holy Ark, or Ark of the Covenant, which is a structure or container that holds scrolls of the Torah. It will generally have doors and an inner curtain as well. And the congregation will stand whenever the Ark is opened, for the uh, Torah to be removed. Another important feature in the synagogue is the bima or pulpit. In reform and in most conservative synagogues, the rabbi will lead the service and the bima is set before the ark facing the congregation. But in synagogues where the cantor or hazan leads and faces in the same direction as the congregation, the bima is in the center of the main room of the synagogue. There's also the Ner Tamid, or the Eternal Lamp. This represents the fulfillment of the commandment to the Israelites to keep a perpetual light burning outside the curtain covering the Holy Ark. Um, and that is from uh, Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 to 21. Another interesting thing that you find in synagogue is the Yad, which literally means hand. It's a pointer used to aid in reading the Torah. Human hands are never supposed to touch the paper or parchment on which it is written. So prayer is a very important part of Judaism. There are both uh, preset or prescripted and spontaneous prayers. Um, Orthodox Jews practice communal prayer three times per day. In the evening, there's the Mariv prayer. In the morning, the Shacharit. And in the afternoon, the Minka. 
Um, these correspond to three ancient daily sacrifices that were performed in the temple in Jerusalem. So the Siddur, which means order, is a book containing the prayers and the order in which they're supposed to be recited. Prayers are also recited by Orthodox Jews throughout the day, such as when getting up in the morning, before washing of the hands, and both before and after eating. The Shema is a famous prayer consisting of three passages from the Torah, which is recited twice daily, once in the morning and once at night. So synagogue prayer and worship has certain general features. The most important time at the synagogue is for the Shabbat or Sabbath, uh, specifically the morning service. This is the longest one in the week. There are readings from the Torah and the prophets. The Torah is divided into 54 sections or parashot for the purpose of the liturgy. All 54 sections are covered in an annual cycle of reading and studying of the Torah. And each of the parashot is divided into seven aliyah, all of which are read in the morning service. Each of the seven readings is preceded and followed by a blessing. The Shabbat morning services will last for three to four hours. The weekday morning services last an hour at Orthodox synagogues. There's also a combined afternoon and evening service that is back to back, about half an hour each. Um, the Shabbat evening services on Friday night, this is the beginning of the Sabbath, Friday evening after sundown, last for around 45 minutes. Um, here are some of the observances done connected to the synagogue. The minyan means number. It's the concept that at least 10 adult males are needed to make up a quorum for public prayer. This is followed in Orthodox Judaism. Many Jews will wear, wear a skull cap, skull cap or yarmulke in Yiddish, kippah in Hebrew. It's worn by men when they're in the synagogue. Uh, they will also wear the talit or fringed prayer shawl when praying in the morning and in the evening on the festival of Yom Kippur. And this is to follow the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verses 37 to 41. Um, tefillin or phylacteries are small black leather boxes that contain verses of scripture, specifically Exodus chapter 13 verses 1 to 10 and verses 11 to 16 and Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 to 9 and chapter 11 verses 13 to 21, which are tied to the forehead and the upper arm. This is a literal application of what the scripture says to keep itself the law on your forehead and on your arm. So Orthodox, Reform, and Conservative Jews have slightly different practices. Orthodox prayers include praying for the restoration of the temple and its offerings and prayers. Orthodox synagogues segregate men from women. Women are in their own section in the back of the room, main room, or in an upper balcony. In Orthodox and in many conservative services, uh, in many conservative synagogues, all the services are in Hebrew. Uh, in Orthodox synagogue services, they actually tend to be looser and less synchronized than in Reform or conservative synagogues. In the Orthodox synagogues, people may arrive throughout the service, and those who arrive late will pray at, at their own pace, rather than skipping ahead to keep um, in sync with the rest of the congregation. So a bit more about Jewish festivals. The high holidays are some of the most important festivals in the Jewish year. The high holy days or the days of awe are 10 days from the beginning of the festival of Rosh Hashanah through the end of Yom Kippur. They're days for reflecting on one's past deeds in the past year. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, and it's celebrated between September or October. Uh, it's believed traditionally that God opens the book of life on Rosh Hashanah, on which he will write a person's fate for the coming year. Specifically, he will actually do the writing on the festival of Yom Kippur. So Jews will take this time to examine their conscience, examine their deeds over the past year. The shofar or ram's horn is blown repeatedly throughout Rosh Hashanah. Uh, the day of Yom Kippur or Day of Atonement is 
Historically, the only time when the divine name, Hashem, would be spoken by the high priest before the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And this should be involved in the ritual to atone for the sins of the people. One of the customs associated with Yom Kippur is eating apples dipped in honey. This is symbolic of the hope that the coming year will be sweet. So there is prayer and supplication practice at the synagogue. The people ask for God's forgiveness. There's also a fast of 25 hours in length from sundown on the eve of Yom Kippur to the following nightfall. And Jews must ask those they've wronged in the past year for forgiveness. Another common Jewish custom is the mezuzah or doorpost affixed beside the front door to a, a home. It's a reminder of God's presence and commandments. It's based on the verse from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 9, which says to write God's laws, quote, on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, unquote. The mezuzah will consist of a decorative container inside of which is a small ruled parchment with handwritten verses from the Shema prayer. Anti-Semitism uh, is almost as old as Judaism. The word means discrimination, prejudice, or bias against Jews. But anti-Semitism uh, rose to even greater levels than before in Europe in the 19th century. Partly, this was a response to Jews moving out of the ghettos and integrated more into European society. So on the one hand, Jews were being emancipated. They were given equality under the law. Many of them assimilated to the broader European society. They got modern education. They entered trades like medicine and the law and so on. And yet, anti-Semitism actually grew through part of this period. One example of a text that's often regarded as anti-Semitic is the Jewish question by the German theologian Bruno Bauer. Uh, his thought is somewhat difficult to classify. He was originally a Protestant, but he leaned towards a kind of rationalist philosophy that even critiqued Christianity, for example. He also tried to argue that Christianity owed less to Judaism than to Greek philosophy. But he argued that the Jews could only be fully emancipated if they relinquish their religious identity. So there were many reasons for the anti-Semitism in Europe. First of all, there was just the traditional Christian prejudice against Jews as the killers of Jesus and as people who had not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. But in the 19th century, there were probably additional reasons for increased tensions. There is the rise of nationalism in Europe, which created new tensions based on basically uh, linguistically defined ethnic groups, like speakers of German got a common identity and that separated them from speakers of French or Polish and what have you. There was also a rise in racism and racialist theories. Uh, before then, people in Europe would regard uh, non-Europeans as maybe weird, maybe exotic, maybe different. That's kind of a human universal. But there were pseudo-scientific racialist theories developed by some Europeans in the 1800s that claimed that people that were not white or European were inferior. Some of this ideology was older, but it was developed and systematized in the 1800s. There were also a lot of huge social and economic and political changes going on. Just in terms of the economy, with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and modern manufacturing, there was new economic insecurity for workers, including skilled workers whose jobs were being replaced by factories. Even independent shopkeepers faced increased competition from department stores, for example. So people who are experiencing tension or anxiety or insecurity might lash out at marginalized groups like the Jews. They were often scapegoated by politicians who blamed a variety of things, including Marxism, a radical uh, socialist philosophy, 
but also liberalism and capitalism, all of these things were blamed on the Jews. The Jews were considered a different race by the uh, European racialists, and thus they were othered even if they converted to Christianity. They weren't regarded as really European or really quote-unquote Aryan. Wilhelm Marr authored a book called The Victory of the Jews Over the Germans in 1879. He was the one who coined the term anti-Semitism, but he basically advocated it instead of criticizing it. He argued that Jewish financiers had benefited from the economic depression of 1873, unlike non-Jewish investors. And he argued that the Jews were so well integrated into European society that they were actually taking over. There was actually an International Anti-Semites Congress in Dresden, 1882. So widespread were these ideas. An infamous example of anti-Semitism was the Dreyfus Affair, which happened in France in the late 1800s. Previously, French Jews had been granted legal equality in 1791 during the French Revolution. But in the 19th century, many Frenchmen had nostalgia for pre-revolutionary France with its strong monarchy, nobility, and church. And Jews, Jews were sometimes blamed for whatever was wrong in post-revolutionary France. There was a lot of political instability in France throughout the 1800s. The monarchy was restored, then it was taken away. Napoleon's grandson was made the leader and then he was deposed. There were a succession of republics. And so perhaps some of this political insecurity um, manifested itself as anti-Semitism. The Dreyfus Affair began in 1894 when Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish army officer, was falsely accused of spying for Germany. It was motivated by anti-Semitism. Despite the fact that the accusations were not true, he was found guilty in a court of law and sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, there were some who disputed the judgment, though, including the famous French novelist Emile Zola. He wrote an open letter to the president of the French Republic accusing the army of a cover-up in the Dreyfus affair. Dreyfus was given a new trial and was found guilty again, but this time under quote-unquote extenuating circumstances. In 1899, the details of the army cover-up were made public. Later, Dreyfus was granted a full pardon, restored to his former rank, and awarded the Legion of Honor. But this, too, just fueled anti-Semitism in France and elsewhere. Jews had begun to settle in Russia in um, previous centuries. So uh, after going to Poland and Lithuania, some went further east. And then also a lot of the lands of the old Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth or Joint Kingdom became part of the expanding Russian Empire. Jews were only legally allowed to settle in parts of the Western Russian Empire, which was called the Pale of Settlement. The Pale of Settlement is shown in the light colored areas on the map on the slide. Um, the Russian Jews were mostly Ashkenazim who spoke Yiddish. In the 18 and early 1900s, there were a series of pogroms or violent riots against Jews in various parts of the Russian Empire. The government did not organize the pogroms, they were spontaneous, but also it did not intervene to stop them. And the pogroms got even worse after the assassination of Tsar or Emperor Alexander II in 1881. Um, another huge source of anti-Semitism that's still going strong today is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This was a fake or fraudulent document created by the Russian secret police sometime between 1896 and 1898. It purported to be the minutes or record of a meeting in which Jews were conspiring for world domination. It circulated widely after the First World War, so around 20 years after it was first created, uh, and after the Russian Empire no longer even existed because of the Russian Revolution. It was published in the U.S. by Henry Ford, the famous automaker, who was a bit of an anti-Semite himself, and it's still quite popular among anti-Semites today. 
Zionism is a modern political movement that started in the 1800s, the late 1800s, and it seeks to return Jews to their ancient homeland in Israel. Jews had long desired to return to the land of Israel. So, for example, in the Passover Seder, it includes the words next year in Jerusalem as a kind of goal or aspiration. But the Zionist movement started in the 19th century as a result of widespread anti-Semitism and persecution of Jews. Many Jews got the idea that they wouldn't be safe or secure or free unless they had their own nation. The movement is named after Mount Zion, the biblical name of a hilltop in Jerusalem described as God's dwelling place. It's also known as the Temple Mount. It's where the ancient temple of the Jews was built. Zionism began with Theodor Herzl, who lived between 1860 and 1904. He wrote a book called Der Judenstaat, or The Jewish State. He covered the Dreyfus affair as a journalist, which made him especially aware of the dangers of anti-Semitism. He became convinced that Jews needed their own nation due to the rise of anti-Jewish prejudice. He insisted that Palestine should be the location of the new Jewish nation and that it would have to be recognized under international law to be viable. There were other places considered for the Jewish homeland. Britain offered part of Uganda in Africa to the Jews in 1903, and they also briefly considered Australia and Canada. But eventually, Zionists agreed that Jews should try to settle in Palestine, and which was then part of the Ottoman Empire, to make that their homeland. And that was the conclusion of an early Zionist Congress that met in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland. There were only 200 Zionists who met there, but their platform became adopted by a lot of later Zionists. Section 3.8 Holocaust. The Holocaust literally means whole burnt, and it's a word that can refer to the burnt offering or the animal sacrifice that used to be offered to God in the ancient temple. Uh, it's a way of referring to the Nazi program of genocide against the Jews. It's also known as the Shoah, which is Hebrew for catastrophe. So around 6 million Jews died during the Second World War, and a lot of that was a result of deliberate policy by the Nazi government of Germany. So the cultures and societies of both Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews in Europe were largely shattered. So in order to understand the Holocaust, you have to understand Adolf Hitler, who was its main mover or instigator. So he ruled Germany from 1933 to 1945. He was the head of the Nazi or NSDAP party, um, which stood for National Socialist German Workers Party. Hitler blamed Germany's defeat in World War I on the Jews. And after becoming chancellor or head of Germany, he passed a series of laws that restricted the rights of Jews, purging them from government, etc. And the situation for the Jews in Germany and Europe just got progressively worse until the end of the war. In 1925, before Hitler came to power, he wrote a book from prison called Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. He was imprisoned because of a previous coup attempt or an attempt to overthrow the government. In Mein Kampf, he recounts how before the First World War, he had learned of a conspiracy of the Jews to use the Social Democratic Party in Germany to infiltrate German politics and to destroy the Aryan or non-Jewish world. The word Aryan was used by a 19th and 20th century European racialists to describe Europeans who were not of Jewish ancestry. Hitler used various dehumanizing terms to refer to Jews in Mein Kampf, such as cockroaches, maggots, or untermenschen, which is German for subhuman. Uh, once he came to power, he passed an increasingly stringent series of laws attacking the rights of the Jews. The Nuremberg Laws were promulgated in September 15, 1935. They revoked the citizenship of Jews living in Germany, and they prohibited intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews. 
Eventually, Jewish businesses were taken over by non-Jews or Aryans. The Nazis also targeted other groups, including homosexuals, Roma, or gypsies, the disabled, communists, and other political enemies. Mass incarceration of the Jews in concentration camps began in 1938. Kristallnacht was an event that happened on November 9th, 1938. The name means Night of Broken Glass. This was a, a coordinated attack against Jewish homes and businesses that was justified as revenge for the assassination of the third secretary at the German embassy in Paris by one Herschel Greenspan, a Jew whose parents had been deported from Germany. After, as a result of this incident, over a thousand synagogues in Germany were plundered and 300 were burned. Jewish homes and businesses were destroyed by stormtroopers and German citizens. Stormtroopers were a type of ideological German soldier at the time. 91 Jews were killed but 26,000 were placed in concentration camps. The Second World War began when Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. It was a part of Hitler's plan to gain large territories for Germany in the East so he could expand the German nation and create an empire. Polish Jews were immediately confined to walled ghettos within the cities where they were afflicted by disease and starvation. They were required to wear the Star of David on November 23, 1939 to visibly identify themselves as Jews. German Jews were moved to Jews' houses, which were separate apartment buildings. Later, they too were required to wear the Star of David starting on September 1st, 1941. The Nazis built hundreds of concentration and labor camps, open air prisons essentially, across Europe. Uh, most of these were not extermination camps, but a lot of them were used to house Jews and other political prisoners. The final solution was Adolf Hitler's term for his goal of exterminating all Jews in Europe to quote unquote solve the Jewish problem. So there were six main death camps or extermination camps used for the mass killing of Jews and other enemies of the Nazi regime, all of which were in Poland. The gassing of Jews began at Chelmno camp in December 1941. This was killing Jews and Roma or gypsies by putting them in sealed trucks where the exhaust fumes would be funneled back inside where all the people would die of as all the people placed inside the truck would die of asphyxiation but this was regarded as too small scale they couldn't kill enough jews quickly enough so they created gas chambers at belzac camp in march 1942 where zyklon b gas was um, used to kill a bunch of jews herded into the chamber at once Zyklon B was a derivative of cyanide, which acted at the cellular level to kill cellular respiration. The largest of the death camps was Auschwitz-Birkenau, where over a million Jews and tens of thousands of Roma, Poles, and Soviet prisoners of war were killed in the gas chambers using Zyklon B. The picture is of a mass grave at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. So not all the people who died at the camps were killed by gas chambers or other overt means, but a lot of them died due to starvation, overwork, and stress. After the Second World War, the state of Israel was established in the Middle East, thus fulfilling the dream of the Zionist movement. The history of Israel actually goes back to after World War I, the First World War, when Britain gained control over Palestine and other territories of the Middle East as a result of their defeat of the Ottoman Empire, which was one of their enemy belligerents in World War I. Other territories of the Ottomans in the Near East were taken over by France. So during this period, Britain made conflicting promises. They promised a homeland 
both to Jews and to Arabs living in the Palestine territory. In 1947, this was a couple of years after the Second World War, which ended in 1945, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine between a Jewish state and an Arab state. The original boundaries of that partition plan are shown on the map on the slide. Israel was officially declared and came into being as the Jewish state of Palestine in May 14, 1948. It was immediately attacked the day after by a lot of its Arab neighbors. There were a series of military conflicts between Israel and other neighboring states, literally beginning the day after the creation of the state of Israel. The first Arab-Israeli war in 1948 started when Egypt, Syria, the Transjordan, and Iraq all invaded Israel. Israel was nevertheless able to win the war to withstand destruction and a ceasefire was declared a year later. In 1967 was the Six Day War. After Egypt announced it was going to cut off shipping to Israel via the Straits of Tehran, Israel launched a preemptive attack against Egypt. Israel was able to defeat a coalition of Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and other neighboring Arab states, gaining the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights as territory. The Sinai Peninsula was later given back to Egypt. The Yom Kippur War of 1973 involved Egypt, Syria, and a coalition of other Arab states again invading Israel. But again, Israel was able to defeat all of the enemy belligerents. The struggles between Israel and other Arab states continue. Uh, in particular, they continue to fight Arab Palestinians in the occupied territories of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. In addition to the conflicts between Jews in the state of Israel and Arabs in surrounding states and the occupied territories of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, there are many conflicts within Israel itself. First of all, there are religious conflicts between secular and Orthodox Jews, such as over the religious authority given to Orthodox rabbis in Israel. There are ethnic conflicts between different types of Jews, such as between Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardim Mizrahim or Beta Israel or Ethiopian Jews. There are political conflicts among Jews and others in Israel. Some Orthodox Jews actually oppose Zionism and the modern state of Israel. They regard it as basically violating or not in accord with God's plan or kind of being presumptive in trying to force the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Many Orthodox Jews do not serve in the IDF or the Israeli Defense Forces. There are also conflicts over Jewish settlers in the West Bank. Many Jews think that the West Bank is part of the biblical nation of Israel and therefore part of their promised land and that they have a God-given right to live and settle there. But other Jews are opposed to the settlements because they think they're uh, overly provocative to the Palestinian Arabs living in the West Bank and make it impossible to have a peace or stable settlement with the Palestinian Arabs. Uh, one example of this conflict is the Gush Emunim, or Block of the Faithful. They're a fundamentalist Jewish group that was founded in 1974, and they claim a divine right to settle in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights. Section 3.9, Life Cycle Events. In this section, we're going to cover some of the other festivals and customs of Judaism that are not connected to times of the year or the calendar, but rather to important events in the person's life. Death uh, has a lot of customs connected with it in Judaism. Pre-burial, preparation of the body, burial, and post-burial. 
In terms of pre-burial customs, there's kriya or tearing. Jews to express their grief will tear or rend their garments. And this happens many times in the Tanakh, such as in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. Orthodox Jews will actually tear their shirts. Liberal Jews will symbolically tear a black ribbon supplied by a funeral home. Um, this is done on the left side of the body when the deceased is a parent or otherwise on the right side of the body. There are a lot of customs regarding the preparation of the body for burial. The body is to be buried as soon as possible after death. The eyes and mouth are closed. A sheet is placed over the body and face. The body is washed while reciting prayers and psalms and then placed in a simple white shroud. The body is always kept face up with its feet, with its feet facing the door and any standing water in the home is poured out. Candles are lit and placed at the head of the body and the body is never left alone. The burial does not involve a public viewing of the body. The deceased is simply buried into the ground. There is no embalming and the deceased is in a plain wooden coffin or in Israel on a stretcher or a bed of reeds. Charitable donations are made on behalf of the deceased rather than gifts of flowers. The hesped or eulogy may be delivered by a rabbi or by a family member or friend of the deceased. There is also a memorial prayer. The graveside liturgy is the Zidik Hadin, or justification of the divine judgment, and the Kaddish prayer is recited by the sons of the deceased after the burial. Jews practice a number of post-burial customs as well. After the funeral, mourners will gather for a meal of consolation. They, the mourning family will sit Shiva for seven days following the burial. In this time, they will receive visitors who will pay their respects, usually talking to them for 30 to 45 minutes before leaving. Um, the visitors are also expected to listen more than just talk to the mourning family. The mourners will not go to work, women will not put on makeup, and the men will not shave. The mirrors of the house will be covered, and the mourning family will sit on low stools or on the floor. The 30 days that follow the burial are referred to as Sheloshim. The mourning family will return to work, but will not participate in social activities like parties. The Sheloshim ends with the saying of the Kaddish prayer. In the year following the burial, the children, specifically of the deceased, will recite the Kaddish every day. Widows in Jewish law are permitted to remarry after 90 days while widowers have to wait for three festivals, which is generally around seven months. The yard site is the Yiddish word for the anniversary of the funeral, the annual commemoration of the death of a loved one. There will be a lighting of a 24-hour candle on the eve of the anniversary of the death. Marriage is regarded positively by Jews. It's regarded as a good state for all humans, including rabbis or clergy. This is often justified based on Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, quote, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, unquote. Weddings can take place in a home, in a synagogue, a hotel, or outdoors, pretty much anywhere. But a rabbi must be present to certify the ketubah. The ketubah is the traditional marriage contract. It stipulates a bride price to be paid to the woman in the case of divorce or the death of a man and a dowry that the bride's family would provide to help the young couple set up a home. It's written in Aramaic. Today, the ketubah lacks a legally binding dowry and bride price, but it's still an important ceremony. The ketubah are often elaborately written and illustrated. They become works of art that are often hung in the family home. The wedding ceremony itself involves the couple standing under a chuppah or canopy supported by four poles. The ring is placed on the index finger of the bride's right hand. The Sheva Berachot are seven blessings recited by the rabbi, cantor, or friends over a cup of wine, and then the bride and groom drink from the cup of wine. There's also the breaking of the glass by the groom, or in Reform Judaism, by both bride and groom. 
Divorce is allowed under traditional Jewish law, but must be initiated by a husband, and a wife must also consent for it to be valid. There's a term get, which means the divorce decree. It's the contract that must be presented by the husband to the wife and stipulates a financial settlement to the wife. There's a concept in Judaism called agunot, or chained or anchored women. A wife is aguna if she never received a get from a husband, but if her husband is not confirmed to be dead. For example, it could cover cases where a husband leaves the wife, but just refers to give, refuses to give her a get, or it could cover cases where a husband is lost at sea or um, missing in action but not confirmed dead during a war, for example. Under Jewish law, an aguna is not permitted to remarry. There's also the concept of mamzer, which is a child born of forbidden relations. If an aguna has a child, that child is mamzer. A Jewish man is also not allowed to remarry until they're divorced, but if they have a child, that child is not considered mamzer. Anyone born of incest, adultery between a married Jewish woman and a Jewish man who's not her husband, or of a parent who is a mamzer is also considered a mamzer. But a child born of an unmarried woman is not a mamzer. A mamzer is not permitted to marry someone with a priestly lineage. There's also a bunch of customs involving conversion to Judaism. Judaism has never been a missionary religion seeking out converts among non-Jews, but conversion to Judaism is possible. There's generally a period of study required beforehand. In Orthodox Judaism, this can be between one and three years. The liberal sects of Judaism generally require just one year of study. There are three general requirements for conversion. Men must be circumcised. Um, the convert must be immersed in a mikvah or ritual bath and they must accept the commandments of Judaism. For circumcision, a man who's already circumcised must still undergo a ritual in which a drop of blood is drawn. There also is a ceremony in the mikvah or ritual bath where a court of rabbis, generally three in number, will pose questions to the intended convert while they're standing in the mikvah to confirm their knowledge of Judaism. The convert is then fully immersed up to their head and then receives a Hebrew name, at which point they've officially converted. So that's it for our summary of Judaism. I hope it was helpful. Next up is gonna be chapter four, Christianity. Until next time.